Good evening, everyone. Good evening to Uzuke. You are welcome. Dr. Odonye, Dr. Oyebuze, Dr. Mba, Dr. Etubi, Dr. Florence, Dr. Nietzsche, Dr. Jolakwe, Dr. Sambo, Dr. Sawa, Dr. Sorikonte, Dr. Ayodeji. Good evening, everyone. We want to commence tonight. So we are opening yeah. our. Oh, good evening. Yes. Good evening. So, yeah, yes. So, Dr. Obuda, please, you have the floor. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everybody. Start. I've started recording. You can start. All right. Good evening, everybody. Sorry, are you hearing me? You are audible, sir. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Good evening, everybody. Okay. So thank you very much once again for the privilege um, to be in this group. I'll be taking questions 371 to 380. Um, so I will start with the first question. Um, a 60-year-old man presents with pre and is found to have a wide complex tachycardia at 140 beats per minute. An EP study done is performed and tachycardia is induced, as shown in FIC 311. The mechanism of tachycardia is, uh, the first question is atrial ventricular reciprocating tachycardia, utilizing an accessory pathway, um, AV nodal reentry tachycardia with aberrant ventricular contraction or conduction, um, C, um, ventricular tachycardia, um, atrial flutter, with aberrant uh, ventricular conduction, and then E for sinus tachycardia. Now, if we can go to the um, intracardiac um, electrogram, that's 311, let's see whether we can decipher anything there. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so basically, um, no, okay, yeah, basically, no, not that. Let's go 311. 311, not that. All right, thank you very much. All right, so if we can go to the, if we can look at that diagram, uh, we are going to see that we have some parts of the regular ECG. So the ECG, the tracings we have, we have V1, and then we have V5, the first one V1, the second one V5, and that is corresponds to a regular um, ECG. And if you look at that, you find out that the QRS complex there is broad. And then, of course, as been stated, the heart rate is 140 beats per minute, of course, which qualifies for um, tachycardia. And if you look also at that, we are not really seeing um a p wave before the uh, qros complex and so one of the things we ask ourselves then at the lower part we are now asking ourselves what's happening downwards so we have the hroa the hroa corresponds to the high uh, right atrium and that gives us a picture that this is a possibility that that's where the sinus uh, node uh, because of course it's at the right atrium and then we also have the bundle of his. So the his, we have two parts there. We have the distal and then we have the prosima. And then, of course, we also have the um, ROV apex, which is the right ventricular apex. So we're trying to look at some correlations. We find out that if you look very well there, you'll find out that the ROV apex and the, um, what do you call it again, the his, uh, his distal corresponds uh, to the QRS complex of, um, of God, of the, so if you can just see that, if you go vertical straight, you find out that the his bundle, uh, and then there's a distal, and then the ROV apex is close to the QRS complex, you know, of the corresponding ECG, which in this context is uh, uh, the QRS complex there. However, if you look at the high right atrium, you find out that that they are not corresponding. They seem to be different just before the QRS complex. You can see a bit delaying, or very correct. 
you can see it's corresponding to the high, the his prosima. Of course, we expect that um, the, uh, there has to be some correspondence. Um, however, you find out that what we are seeing basically here is that there seems to be um, a correspondence basically with the, um, um, the, that's the QRS complexes and then for the distal and then the ROV apex. However, there seems to be a loss of dissociation uh, between the HROA and the uh, his prosima, which of course tells us about what happens in the atrium before it gets to the ventricle. So going back to our question, it gives us a little. So what we can see here is that there seems to be um, an AV dissociation because there's a lack of relationship between the atrial and ventricular depolarization, and that confirms um, the presence of um, an atrial ventricular dissociation. And of course, since there's an atrial ventricular dissociation, and then we have that the QRS complexes are broad, and we also find out that um, the heart rate, of course, we said just as the question um, was there, was 140 uh, bits uh, per minute. Uh, that corresponds to a ventricular uh, tachycardia. So when we go back to that question, we see AV reciprocating tachycardia utilizing an as three pathway. No, uh, because of course you see that QRS complex, see how broad it is. We also go back again, AV uh, nodal reentry tachycardia. Of course, in those ones, since they are uh, they are supraventricular tachycardias, we expect that the QRS complex uh, will definitely be. Um, you know, with may narrow, and then the other option, ventricular tachycardia, uh, that would be the best option, um, of course, because of that AV dissociation, how broad it is, and then the heart rate. And then we're talking again um, about um, um, atrial flow with aberrant ventricular conduction, that would not be that. And then sinus tachycardia, of course, that would not be that. So for answer for that, for response more to a ventricular tachycardia. I don't know whether there's any question or um, any feedback or any correction. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello? Looks like nobody's following me. Hello? We are here. We are following you. Please continue. Right. Thank you. All right. Any any other addition, please? Can I go to the next question? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So the second question, um, it looks as though I have a lot of uh, intracardial electro, uh, electrograms to talk about today. So the next question is, which of the following statements is correct regarding the electrophysiologic abnormality depicted in um, FIG 3.12? So the first is associated with syncope and then sudden death. When present with an inferior MI is an indication for temporary pacing. It typically reflects block at the level of the AV node proximal to um, the his bundle, and then carotid sinus massage typically abolishes this abnormality. So let's go first of all to the figure. And uh, so let's look at it. Um, okay, all right. So basically, in um, intracardiac electrograms, there are usually a correlation with the surface ECG. And uh, like in this um, uh, this uh, uh, representation, we have the V one. We also have the right atrium, and then we have tracings from the his bundle. Now, interestingly, um, unlike the previous one, in this one, there's a P wave. Um, of course, because there's a P wave, the P wave seems uh, look uh, alike. However, uh, there's definitely also a P arrow interval. Uh, so if you look very well at this particular um, ECG, the first, which is a V1, you will notice that that there is a widening of the Q uh, of the PRO interval. So if you use a caliper, you will notice that the PRO interval in V1 seems to be prolonging 
seems to be prolonging, seems to be prolonging. And then towards the end, one, two, three, four, five, six, at the seventh, we see that there's a drop. And in that drop, we see that there is no QRS complex. And then we see another P uh, wave starting. So you can see where the arrow is. And then, of course, there's a drop there. Now, we now go again to the right atrium. And we see um, also, we see depolarization that is corresponding to the level of the P wave. You can see the arrow A, the right atrium. You can see those drawings corresponding to the P wave. Um, um, then also we go to the bundle, uh, the his bundle, and then in the his bundle we have the AH interval, just like we have um, different kinds of interval, like the PRO interval. We have the um, arrow arrow um, interval, and then we have the AH interval. So the AH interval definitely uh, we are talking about the um, from that atrial, and then of course to the his bundle. So on that eight interval, we see that there is, <laughs> sorry, please, there's a prolongation. So luckily, in this, um, yeah, in this drawing, sorry, thank you, we see that it was 240 MS, and then it goes to 280, and then goes to 290, goes to 295, um, goes to 295, prolongs to 325, and then there's a drop, of course. So basically, um, what this is just telling us is that definitely, um, and you can see that that last one, there is no AH. So we have an A, there is a drop in the H. And then, of course, we have that um, there is, a, um, there is a, a drop in that one, almost corresponding to the same um, place. You also look very well there. You find out that that AH corresponds to the right atrium. You can see that the A pattern, the A is corresponding directly with the arrow A. What is in the arrow A? You see that correspondence, correspondence. And then of course, after that, there's the H. The, the H. So we see that there's prolongation and then there's a drop. So of course, this is uh, this is just telling us that a second degree hard block and then with the Weckenbeck's type, um, type one, second degree hard block. And of course, we could uh, find out from the um, the tracing. And then, of course, one of the things we find out is that um, in contrast to um, um, Mobis type 2, um, where there is sudden block of impulses. So in unlike the type 1, type 1, of course, we could see that there was a prolongation. However, for uh, the type 2, there is not necessarily any prolongation. So we find out that um, the type 1, second degree hard block, um, the QRS complex duration is usually normal and reflects block at the level of the AV node proximal to the his bundle. And because of that, um, we find out that the uh, clinical cost is usually benign compared to a type 2. And usually, um, no specific interventions is needed um, in the absence of symptoms. Um, also, it's important to note that type 1 AV block can occur in the setting of acute MI. And usually in the setting, uh, this happens when there is inferior wall um, infection. And, and however, when this happens, such occurrences, they are usually transient and they do not typically um, require um, any form of therapy. However, uh, the uh, presence of higher blocks, um, including maybe type two, second degree high block and third degree high block in acute MI, of course, indicates greater myocardial damage, and then, of course, predicts high mortality. And then, of course, um, when we use vagal maneuvers, vagal ma maneuvers, um, like uh, carotid massage, what it does is that typically uh, it helps to enhance type 1 AV block. What it does is that it prolongs the AV node conduction, okay? So because of that, you find out that it is usually useful to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 AV block because, of course, it causes prolongation. And because of that, we'll be able to pick out these things better uh, compared to um, um, a type uh, 2. So we're going back to our questions, uh, the answers. You say that it is associated with syncope and sudden death. We said no, uh, that is usually benign. So compared to the type 2, so we, we can't choose that option. Also, when present with an inferior MI, it is indication for temporary patient. Like we said, it's usually benign. And then with no symptom, we don't expect 
to pace the patient. Um, three says it typically reflects block at the level of the AV node, proximal um, to the bundle of his, of course. Uh, that's the same thing. Uh, that's true, very true. And then carotid sinus massage uh, typically abolishes this abnormality. No, with carotid um, sinus massage, we expect uh, that uh, the abnormality should be enhanced. It uh, accentuates uh, that, uh, 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 that is the type one, um, that is, uh, sorry, the second degree type one um, AB block. So thank you very much. I don't know whether we have more insights or clarification. It's fantastic. Please continue. Thank you. Oh, yes. thank Hello. You. Yes. Please continue. Yes. Um. So I, I just want to inquire from this um, elect, um intracardiac electrogram. Um. How are you able to delineate which one is an infranodal or a nodal block? Like because the 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 correct option in this one is saying it typically reflects block at the level of the triventricular node proximal to the his bundle. Are you able to delineate that from the intracardiac electrogram? All right, so so basically in this electrocardiogram, um, we did not have, because usually um, some of them, some of them we expand to tell us um, whether it's distal or whether it's proximal as the case okay. may be. So however, um, from what we have seen already, they just put a general one and we can see that the AH is already being prolonged. And so with that mm -hmm. knowledge, what we know is that it's a um, second degree type one. And of course, once it's second okay. degree type one, we already know that it is not infranodal compared to the uh, uh, type two, which is infranodal. Mm -hmm. And then of course the type three as the case may be. So uh, from this okay. one, we're just a summary. It, it didn't, it's not expand. In fact, in some of the um, intracardiac, uh, some of them, we could see about 10 or maybe even 20 readings but this is just a summarized one, and this is very clear oh, because okay. we those things there. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Sorry, Thank you very much. Hello. 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 Am I audible? Hello. Hello. Yeah, we are hearing, please. Okay. Yes. If if you look at the the tracing, there is there are two intervals here, even though. We're the HB interval. You can have AH interval and you can also have the HB interval. Yeah. Now, instances where you see AH interval is being prolonged. That is most likely, most at times, uh, uh, nodal or supranodal delay that you're having. By the time you're beginning to have prolongation in HV interval. HV interval. Please put some volume. We are streaming our ears, please. Chief oh, Sawa. so sorry. Uh, can you, am I, am I, is it better now? Yeah. Yes. Fairly better. better now. Fairly. Fairly. Yeah. What about now? Mm, better. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, what I'm trying to say about it, you know, there are two intervals actually. If you look at the HBE, the his bundle electrocardiogram, there's the AH interval as between the A and the H. It's actually the time at which the uh, depolarization moves from the atrium to the his bundle, that is at the AV node. Okay, then the time between the HB interval is between the his bundle that goes to the ventricle. So infranodal delays, you see prolongation of HB intervals, not AH intervals. Okay, so that's another way you can actually tell from this. So from this uh, tracing, you can actually see that even though we are not given the HB interval, from this tracing, you can deduce that there is almost no uh, prolongation of our HV interval. So it is unlikely to be an infranodal problem. Rather, it is from the AV node that we're having this prolongation. Thank you. 
Wow, thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Um, Sawa, can you just show me the HB interval with your cursor? Then a, a second one, as like show me, it doesn't so long. Okay. Sorry, can you see? Can you see any prolongations? No, no, it's not. Okay, so. Uh, most at times, if this is that, if, if it is an intranodal block, it's the HV interval that you see that is beautiful. So this time around, we're seeing it on a short form, AH interval that is progressive. Okay, and a drop. And typically, the next AH interval immediately after, after the block is much, much shorter than the AH interval preceding the block. Let me create this also that you can see it clearly. You can see this. This is a typical like one kickback. This AV interval after the block, much shorter than the AV interval, AH interval, sorry, before the block. And the sequence continues like that. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Just to also note that for the AH interval, the normal AH interval is between 50 and 120 milliseconds. And then the normal HV interval is between 35 and 55 milliseconds. Um, so that suggests to us that the HV is actually smaller compared to the AH. So even using this as our guide, we will see that the AH is already 240 on 280, 290, 295, 295, 325. So it's a pointer that the AH interval is prolonged. You know, so just to note that. Thank you very much. And the one that just recap, you said the AH interval was the normal. Sorry, the normal for the AH interval is between 50 and 120 milliseconds, and then for the HV is between 35 and 55 milliseconds. But when we take a look at that diagram, we'll find out already that it's 240, uh, the smallest is 240 already. So that tells us that uh, there is prolongation of the H interval. And that can be a pointer because sometimes when that happens, um, it's very possible that um, it's a pointer to high vagal tone, um, intrinsic AV nodal disease, and then conduction down the slow pathway of AVM. Those are all potentials when you look at that. But from what we are seeing, come, because whatever you see and you see, you have to compare it with, uh, you have to compare it with the uh, ECG up there. And then, of course, the ECG is showing us that the PRL PR interval is already prolonged. So it's a pointer, of course, that there is um, a second degree heart block type 1. Okay. All right. So the uh, question 373, um, basically um, it's asking us questions about um, indications for a permanent cardiac PC. And so for which of the following patients is permanent cardiac PC, not reasonable therapy. And then uh, the first question was a 35 year old man with asymptomatic type 2, um, second degree AV block, and then signing by the cardiac. 
um, the, the first second is 70 year old man with LVH, persistent fatigue, light headed headedness with marked first degree AV block. Uh, the PR interval was told us to be um, 0 0.3, um, 0 0.36 seconds. And then um, a 57 year old man with acquired asymptomatic third degree AV block. And then a 40 year old woman, however, this woman has asymptomatic congenital AV block. And then 56 year old marathon runner with calf cramps and 3.4 second pauses uh, during uh, in sleep. Um, so basically, um, it's important just to note that um, acquired, just trying to go through some of the key things that for um, indications for permanent pacing um, in AV conduction disorders may include permanent or intermittent complete third degree heart block, permanent or in, uh, intermittent um, type two, second degree AV block, then type one, second degree heart block if accompanied by symptoms or evidence of block at or inferior um, to the bundle of his. Um, so also just to note that it's not indicated in asymptomatic first degree uh, block or type one second degree AV block proximal to the bundle of his, which brings us back to the former question about whether it's proximal or distal. So that's a um, second degree type uh, type one. And then it's um, um, occasionally, however, patients with first degree AV block marked prolongation of the um, PR interval in this context um, greater than 300 milliseconds. In the question under review, we see that the patient has a PR interval of 360 milliseconds, which is, of course, more than uh, the 300 uh, milliseconds are hemodynamically symptomatic uh, because of the loss of the effective AV synchrony. Uh, also to note that uh, because of vagal influence, uh, many normal people um, especially athletes um, have a high resting bagel too. And that's why most times, of course, they are um, they usually have a sinus bradycardia. Um, it's important to know that they may exhibit pauses um, that are significantly longer than three seconds during sleep um, in or itself. Therefore, um, it is not sufficient to warrant a permanent uh, pacemaker. So going to that discussion, we found out that we found out that this man. Um, he's a marathon runner um, you're with calf cramps. And then, of course, it has um, 3.4 second pauses uh, during sleep. And this is expected, like we said, uh, because many of these people, athletes, uh, they usually have a high uh, vagal tone. And therefore, what it means is that for some of them, they may have pauses even as much as greater than three. Uh, seconds uh, during sleep. And so that definitely knocks off that uh, question, uh, that uh, answer. And so for that one, um, uh, the answer definitely is, which is the false, is a 56 year old marathon runner uh, with calf cramps and 3.4 second pauses uh, during sleep. All right. All right, please, any other, um, hello? Hello, yeah, audible, sir. Okay, so um, is any other um, voice, adding any voice, any other one? Please continue, sir. They can always call you back. Okay, thank you very much. So we jump to... 34, 374, a 62 year old man underwent pacemaker insertion four years ago because of marked bradycardia. So, of course, he had marked bradycardia. Um, so, as part of his exercise program, he has been using a rolling boot, a machine, um, and then recently um, he had several episodes of, um, uh, of uh, syncope that have occurred only during such exercise. So he finds out that it's only when he's having the exercise that the patient has the syncope. So a 24-hour halter was ordered for the patient 
And then uh, when this was all that, uh, there was a redeem strip, and then the redeem strip um, was fig um, three point um, one three. Yeah. So and um, the question is during one near syncopal episode while ruling, which of the following is correct? So it's very interesting because this they noted that um, that uh, this happened to this patient um, when he was ruling. So that suggests that um, this happened during um, an exercise. And so we just going to look at that. We find out that of course there is a pacemaker, and um, they give a record. The record suggests to us that um, it's a dual chamber uh, pacemaker, a DDD. And of course, um, at the rates we can see about seventy beats per minute. And then a strip that was used <coughs> was the AVF. And then of course we can see that going at 25 millimeter per second. So basically we see um, this, uh, there, are, there are some spike piece there. We see the one for the atrium and then for the first one, the one for the atrium. <coughs> and then you see the P wave after, and then this uh, P spike for the ventricle. And then of course we see the KRS complex and then the T wave, we see that P spike for the atrial uh, and then we see the P wave. Then of course this base pipe for the ventricle, we see the um, the uh, the QRS complex, and then all of a sudden we now see some uh, bizarre things that looks like fasciculations. Of course, that would happen um, when um, someone is even when people are having tremors or uh, those are the fasciculations. And then of course um, because of that, we found out that then for the machine decided to. Um, over sense and then saw it like as though um, he was uh, um, doing, uh, saw the, sorry, uh, that uh, muscle contraction. And then because of that, it over sensed and then there was no output, you know, happening. Um, so going back to, sorry, what's happening? Okay, sorry, please. Sorry, please. I put a book on my laptop and I removed went out of the equation, please. All right. Okay. So, all right. Going back to the patient. So, uh, this patient, like we said, um, patient had a pacemaker, and then it's important also to find out the patient, the kind of lead, because sometimes some of these pacemakers might either be bipolar or unipolar. In the unipolar, the uh, the uh, the parts that make complete the circuit one, the lead, the end of the lead. And then the positive side will be the battery, that is the anode and the cathode. And then, however, for the bipolar, the anode and the cathode would be at the, the wire. So this patient, of course, is ruling. And ruling would mean that the patient is actually moving the pectoralis uh, major, and then, of course, the possibly the deltoid and the muscles around. And because of, of that uh, muscle contraction, uh, which is supposed to be an artifact, the uh, the uh, uh, ECG, the pacemakers uh, oversenses, and uh, because of oversensing, there's no pacemaker output. And then that's why the patient has the uh, that uh, area that is flat, the baseline is flat, the artifacts. And then that's why the patient usually has that uh, syncopal uh, feeling. That's one of the things that happens. So, and then of course, after a while, you can see that the uh, the uh, this thing picks up, you know, and then we see some readings, there's some QRS complexes. Um, the, after that artifact. So when we look at that, we find out that going back to the questions, we want to ask ourselves, okay, what are the questions? So the first question is, there is evidence of single chamber uh, pacing system. Of course, that's not true. Even the um, the equation already, there is already a DD, and then we see the spikes. There's both a spike for both the, um, you know, the P wave and then the QRS complex. And definitely that answer is not correct. Also, there is um, evidence of oversensing by the pacemaker. We could see that that happened uh, when that uh, when the um, um, the uh, uh, muscle movements um, or fasciculations were happening, and then because of that, of course, the muscle contraction that was when the pacemaker oversensed and there was no output. Also, uh, we see that there is undersensing of atrial activity. Well, that's not true because we can see that there is uh, the atrial spikes. 
And then we also see that there is lack of capture of the ventricles. Of course, that's not true because you can see that there was a capture of the when that oversensing happened during the muscle contraction. There's lack of capture of atria. That's not true uh, because of, of course, you can see those spikes. And then before that uh, issue happened. So the answer uh, here is pointing more to oversensing by the pacemaker, which happened in that uh, period when there are muscular contraction, and then oversensing happened, and then there was a lack of pacemaker activity during that period, and then um, that's what happened. All right. So that is just that for uh, of that. Thank you. I don't know whether there is any um, uh, question or suggestion or uh, more light to this particular question. Thank you. Oh, hello, Dr. Honda. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I, I just need to get this right. Um, you said something about the cathode and the anode, and then also the del deltoid and pectoralis in and line. Please, yeah. can you just recap? I had the phone call, so I didn't really capture the reason why you said there was, I think, fasciculation. So, so you said something about the anode and cathode, and thereafter you talked something about um, the muscles, the deltoid and pectoralis in and line. Please, can you just recap? Okay, so I was talking about the the types of um, the types of uh, uh, peacemakers. So we say that for some peacemakers, uh, they are unipolar. So when it's unipolar, means that the uh, anode will be in the battery. That is the pulse generator around the pulse generator. That will be where the anode is. And of course, the anode is the positive, and then the cathode will be at the tip of the uh, of the lead. So also we have the bipolar, and the bipolar, the uh, the uh, uh, electrodes they are more anode and cathode are more at the tips. So of course the tip which makes the contact with the with the muscle that area is the cathode, which is of course the negative, and then we have the anode, uh, which is positive. So in the bipolar, uh, both areas are in the lead, unlike the unipolar that has the anode. So we, what we said was that this patient was exercising and because the patient was exercising and there was, there was contraction and of course, even when we do our regular ECGs for patients and they are having either, they are not staying in the place or they are having um, contractions, you find out that this fasciculation will be shown on the ECG tracing. So in this context, because of what is happening, the, uh, the pacemaker, don't forget that we said in the unipolar, the anode is at the pocket and the pocket is usually buried under the clavicle. And when this patient is rolling, rolling is the kind of sport or a kind of exercise where you use your hands, you know, to, as if you are doing a paddle. And because of that, one of the muscles affected the, uh, the pectoralis major, the deltoid. And don't forget that, like we said, the anode is in that area, that area where this movement is taking place. And once these fasciculations are happening uh, the, because of the muscle contraction, the pacemaker senses, over senses, and because of that, there is no output. And so what it happened, no output, and then it inhibits pacemaker activity or inhibits uh, pacemaker's output. And when this happens, nothing is happening, which is where you see that area of the uh, the, the area of the rhythm street flat as if nothing is happening, but just seems to have a simulation before, and that would be that would be around the period when the patient is having those uh, form of syncopal attack because in this last one, the patient had a near syncopal episode, and then that's why the patient, and after which the uh, the ECG tracing started trying to uh, come back. So that was why I'm talking about, that's why I talked about the unipolar and then the bipolar, because one of the ways to sort this out would be possible most times, and if you encounter the patient don't move or all that, would be probably to change the configuration of um, the uh, ECG, uh, for, uh, sorry, pacemaker from um, the regular lead uh, system to a bipolar configuration. Also, in sometimes when some patients have oversensing, which is what is happening here, um, usually the uh, the pacemaker can be placed in um, an asynchronous uh, mode, usually by application of a magnet. And these magnets are already symptom caused by uh, uh, the pacemaker malfunction and can aid in the diagnosis. So, but basically that is just what, uh, uh, the, what we presented. And when you look at all the options, it's pointing more uh, towards um, an evidence of oversensing by the pacemaker due to the muscular activity or muscular contraction 
um, that occurred uh, when this near syncopal attacks or syncopal attacks happened to, to this patient. Thank you. Okay, so in this is a bipolar configuration. Hello? I said, so in essence, this is a bipolar configuration. No, no this is unipolar because the, it is a unipolar. Uh, that is why the patient is having these uh, issues with the uh, oversensing in this context. Because, of course, we say that the uh, pathway, which is generator, the pore generator, is buried just around dust under and, of course, in contact with the delt, with the pectoralis, another pectoralis area. So, with activity, especially relating to that muscle, you know, we have this fasciculation and most times it oversenses and causes this activity because it's every time this patient had this syncopal attack, it's usually, it was usually related to the patient doing uh, the, uh, what do you call it again, patient doing the exercise. Okay, sorry, sorry I'm just, you said the anode eh, is, is usually um, at the pocket, whether it's at the pocket, that's at the clavicle area, right? Yes, yes, that's where the battery, generally for all pacemakers, the battery okay, then, of the... Uh, okay, the, and the cathode is... The cathode no, what is I where... Is for, are you hearing me? Are you hearing I'm me? I'm hearing you. Oh, rather than the class, sorry. Okay. Uh, yes, okay. So what I said is that for all the uh, pacemakers, they are usually buried just underneath the clavicle. I know that the close muscle there is the pectoralis major, like I said. Now, I'll say that there are two types in this context. We have the uh, and, uh, the unipolar bipolar. In fact, these days we even have leadless ECGs and leadless pacemakers as well. So we, but for this context of what we are discussing, we have the unipolar. In the unipolar type, the positive, which is the anode, is on the pulse generator surface. So it's just like a battery has positive and negative. So, but for the unipolar, that pulse generator surface is the anode of the circuit because you need a positive and a negative. Why the cathode is at the tip of the lead, you know, that makes the circuit complete. In the bipolar, the um, the cathode or the anode had no relationship with the post generator surface. Rather, what was done was that the lead itself, the lead itself has both the anode and the cathode. So there has, so whatever is happening on that area, the, that's the, uh, the post generator area, does not necessarily affect the uh, affect compared to the one where the is unipolar and you have the um, cathode, sorry, anode at the head, and the cathode at the downside. I don't understand. All right, no problem. Thank you very much. You can go on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Jito Wonder, for that explanation. Please, what I need you to help, can you hear me, sir? I'm here, sir. Okay, thank you so much. What I need you to help me clarify now: this incident here does it qualify to be termed as a pacemaker malfunction? That's my first question. The second is: I want to assume that this question can be rephrased with some variation. How does under sensing, how does it show? I mean, what am I? Because in the context of under sensing, in under sensing of atrial activity, am I going to? I I expect that um, I will still see the um, the spikes, since both the atria and the ventricle are paced, as in this uh, case. So does that mean that in under sensing? I will still see the pacemaker spike. I, I'm just trying to understand what exactly am I to look for to for me to be able to say comfortably that this is a case of under sensing. And then this under sensing, um, like you said that the over sensing is a problem with unipolar leads. Does that mean that um, uh, over sensing does not occur with bipolar? And then under sensing, is it a problem of unipolar? I don't know if I uh, maybe I'm asking too many questions at the same time. Hello, Chief. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. How do you 
Okay. So uh, that's what I'm just um, trying to understand. Thank you. I think he's having network issues. He just, um, so he'll come back. Yes. The presenter is no longer on the call. Um, seconds or one minute. <laughs> And you, the question is, you're probably supposed to take us out in on all of these, right? Sorry, your network is dragging. I didn't hear you clearly. Hello. Hello, hello, Ma. Your network is dragging. Okay. <laughs> supposed to take us um, on a topic. Oh, are you hearing me now? Yes, ah. announcement. Um, Chief was okay with you. Was the announcement? All right, hello, yes, welcome back. He hello, hello, Dr. Obuda. Yeah, yeah, are you hearing me? We can hear you now. Hello, are you hearing me? We can hear yes, you, yes, sir. Now. We hear you loud and clear. All right, Better please. Than so, sorry, so what was the question, please? Okay, my question, sir, is that the does this incident, this um, case scenario, does it qualify to be called a pacemaker malfunction? That's my first question. Then my second question is, this issue of oversensing, is it peculiar to just unipolar, um, uh, unipolar, what do you call it? Yeah, unipolar pacemakers. Then the thought is that how do I make okay, an assessment okay. of under sensing? I think those are the three things I'm, I'm worried about. All right. So, so um, I hear me, sir. I can hear you loud and clear. All right. So, so basically, um, um, for based on uh, pacemaker malfunction, we may have uh, problems with pacing. Uh, there may also be problems with sensing, and then uh, there could also be pacemaker associated dysarrhythmias, as the case may be. So, but we are talking about sensing, and then definitely we're talking about sensing. Sensing could be under sensing um, or over sensing. So, we are, the question we are talking about was basically over sensing, and um, over sensing happens when um, the and basically when these electrical signals. Um, um, inappropriately recognize um, um, native, uh, the general native cardiac activity, and then because of that, um, pacing is inhibited. Um, and we talked about this, this could occur um, because of uh, muscle activities. And of course, most times um, in this context, we talked about the pectoral muscles and because of the uh, muscle activities and the artifacts that may be generated, you find out that this can cause um, inappropriate signals and then, of course, to inhibit pacing. And like you said, um, it's not as though it's only a problem of, um, it's only a problem of uh, the uh, unipolar leads, but we said that unipolar, because of the proximity of the, um, the uh, uh, cathode, sorry, anode, as the case may be, in that peculiar area, um, that we, we see that many times the um, um, the unipolar uh, um, uh, pacemakers are more prone to oversensing, as the case may be. So, in in con uh, conversely, um, you see, under sensing occurs when uh, the pacemaker fails to sense uh, native um, cardiac activity, and then sometimes um, how we uh, we see that uh, most times we find out that you can see that maybe ECG findings. You can see presence of pacing spikes within the QRS complex. Um, so, like for what we saw, you can look very well that there was there was a pacing atrial pacing spike, and then after that we see the P wave, and then we see a, a spike, and then we see the QRS. But when we start seeing pacing spikes within um, QRS complex, and then maybe a, even within the P uh, the P wave, as the case may be, um, that means that uh, there is probably um, um, on the sensing and of course because 
the pacemaker is failing to sense um, native uh, cardiac activity. And these are all problems um, as regards uh, the pacemakers, like we say. But what we are talking about today, um, or especially in this question, we are talking about oversensing. And basically, we are saying that it's happening uh, because of, of course, these uh, uh, um, uh, fasciculations or things that could occur as a result of uh, muscle activity. And then the pacemaker senses it, uh, um, uh, inappropriately recognizes it as native cardiac activity. And then, of course, um, inhibits the pacing, and then whatever we are happening happens there. So I don't know what I've been, I made clear, I've confused you for that, sir. <laughs> no, okay. you've been a great help. Thank you very much. I have... Are you hearing me, sir? Yes, sir, I can hear you. I don't, what's happening. I'm not, I don't seem to be hearing loud again. No, but I, I had your explanations and I'm fine. Hello, sir. Thank you. I, Thank heard, you. Hello, I heard you. I think, I, you think you, I think I think this issue of testing oh, oh. and, and inhibition and all that. I think we should leave it for when Prof will oh. give us. Thank you for the for, for, for the understanding, sir. Please could you proceed to the next question? We will spend close to 30 minutes in this question. All right. So you hear me. Chief Ofunda, can you hear me? I'm hearing, but it seems as though I'm not hearing very loud. We can hear you. We can hear you well, sir. All right. So let me just go over to the next question. As all right. So the the next question mm -hmm. is. Um, okay, we are at um, three seven five. The ECG in um, um, three point one four is not compatible with which of the following. So um, they're asking us which do we not expect to see. So uh, basically, this is also um, a dual uh, chamber uh, uh, a pacemaker because of course we, as we are seeing um, atrial spikes, we are also seeing ventricular spikes. So you find out from the V, uh, the first one we are seeing, uh, we are seeing those QRS complexes. And then we see um, a spike, um, an atrial spike, and then we don't see uh, we don't see uh, the regular QRX that should follow the uh, the, uh, uh, the that is the ventricular spike. We see again that's number three, number four. We see again um, the uh, uh, the atrial spikes, P wave, ventricular spikes. None is following, and then after uh, after some time, we are now seeing that. There is a spike for, and then the atrial, and then a spike, and then a QRS follows. And then we are seeing, um, is on that one, we are just seeing basically a ventricular uh, um, a, a contraction. And then the T wave come back again. We see a spike, atrial spike, P wave present, no um, a, a ventricular spike, none is following. And then we go again and see a spike, P wave. A spike for the ventricular and none, none is falling. So um, basically, um, we know that this is a dual chamber. And we are also seeing that the atrial pacing um, is going on well. So there's atrial pacing at the first. However, there's effective um, atrial depolarization as we are seeing the P waves. Um, however, for the ventricular pacing, if apart from that one, and we are seeing that there's actually pacing, but we are not really seeing that QRS complex. However, I think yeah, we're not really seeing the QRS complex, but we can we can we can see that um, um, the some of the QRS complexes are not present as far as this uh, this one is concerned. And then also we go further also to see that um, there is also failure uh, to capture uh, most commonly uh, occurs due to uh, when this happens uh, usually due to dislodgement um, of the pacemaker leads um, from the on the cardiac surface. Uh, and this usually happens in the first few weeks after implant implantation. Um, however, um, with modern designs, uh, this is, uh, has been reduced to a barely minimum. Also, um, failure to capture can also occur due to lead insulation breaks. That can also happen. Um, this can also occur um, when uh, this, uh, the, uh, when the, um, this, uh, what do you call it again? The, um, when there is uh, in conditions where there is hyperkalemia, in conditions with drugs like anti-arrhythmia drugs like fecanide, 
Uh, these are all potential things that can happen. Also, when the battery is reducing, uh, these are things we can see um, when the battery is reducing. So when you go back to our uh, question, so basically the question is in which conditions um, is this not uh, is this uh, not compatible with? So we are looking at lead insulation breach, and we talked about something like that. That can happen. This is uh, the failure to capture. This can happen in um, when there's lead insulation break. We go away to hyperkalemia. We said also this can happen uh, because uh, in most times the threshold, uh, the patient threshold is increased, and the things that can increase it can be in the setting of hyperkalemia. So this can potentially occur. That's not the picture being shown. I think the picture, yes, this is the picture exactly. So this can happen in hyperkalemia. Also, we go lead dislodgement. This is very common in lead dislodgement. And then we see loose screw set. In the loose screw set, we um, um well, what is happening is there is failure of output. The, uh, this is not just failure to capture in these ones because. Of course, when the loose screw set, uh, that means that there is um, um, a dislodgement from the uh, main complex, okay? Because the loose screw set helps to secure uh, the lead to the generator. So when there is a loose screw set, the leads cannot be, uh, the leads are not properly attached to the first generator, which is, of course, buried in the, the place we talked about. And so when this happens, we find out that there will be no output because, of course, that is where the pores is generated from before it can be fed to the leads. So when that happens, of course, there will be no output. So that what we would expect to see when there is a loose um, um, set screw would be that there will be loss of output. And then, of course, uh, the next one is impending battery depletion. Of course, that one is a, a part of it. So the, our answer is pointing more um, towards um, um, a loose screw set. That's one of the things we expect uh, to see uh, there. So thank you very much. I don't know whether there is any um, clarification or or uh, maybe contribution to what we are discussing. Thank you. Um, thank you, Doctor Bobia. Am I am I audible? Yes, you yes, ma. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you um, for all your experience. Oh, oh. Uh, so uh, maybe yeah. just to add for, um, yes, like you have said, this is um, on the sensing. And when um, the litter on the sensing, that means that um, the is not really recognizing or acknowledging that there is, an, there is a P wave. So if um you set um if the setting is um the amplitude uh -huh. to the setting if it's low, for instance, it's possible that it does not um sense, so it will not um actually peace because it's not even sensing um um any P wave at all. In the case of hyperkalemia, for instance. Um, um, you know that um, just like you have explained in some instances, so we can have flattening of the um, P wave. You know, we start from the um, um, the tall tented thin wave, then we can have on the other side the um, flattening of the um, P waves before we get to the sine waves. So it might not actually um peak. Um, recognize um, an intrinsic um, P wave. So it's also um, possible in that um, instance not to see it. So like the pending battery, there's not those things to explain would be possible. But the confusing part to me now is this um, those, um, set screw. Is it because um, the impedance will be high? I don't know if you came across, although there's a difference. Okay, is it because um, we'll have a high, there's something they call a high impedance and when we have like a loose um, screw set, at, like it will be misfiring. Will it be because of um, that, that we are expected to see like a higher, this thing, that's why D is, a, is not um, correct. I'm not sure if my question is clear. I don't know what is happening that, I don't know what is happening, I'm just, uh... Oh, you're not hearing. Okay, let, let's just I'm not on. hearing very well. 
and let's we'll reserve our questions till maybe when okay, so, so, so basically like like we said okay uh, we, hello hello are you hearing me ma yes All i right. can so hear you thank you there, there has to be a con they, for the circuits to be complete there has to be a connection between our pacemaker which uh, and of course in this context we mean the where the pulse generator is and then with the lead so if we are talking about either a bipolar lead or a unipolar lead there has to be a contact between the lead and the um and the uh, pulse generator and of course in the context what we need um, is a pin that there has to be a connection so when there is um, minimal contact or when or in this context we are talking about a loose screw set and or a disconnection so what will happen is that electrical current will not be transmitted from the pulse generator to the leads and so or sometimes the energy itself that is delivered may not be enough so when that happens there will be no output so when those out that happen so compared to um, what they call it again compared to um, what they call it again? The Over regular sensing. one that we talked about for a loose screw set uh, because of impedance, uh, because of the problem with the generation of impulse. So what we will have there in the context will be um, uh, no input compared to where we are having uh, what we are seeing uh, here in the image that was showed. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ma. So Thank the you next so question is, sorry, should I continue? Yes. Yes, please, sir. All right. Thank you very much. So the next question is on 376. And we are being asked on um, the sinus node function. And the question is, which of the following um, is correct? Um, first of all, the, the sinus node, um, and then what's happening? Atropine enhances um, cardio inhibitory input to the sinus node. So, of course, we know that basically what happens, uh, or what we cause that will be uh, anything that is the vagal, any vagal stimulation. Um, conversely, um, atropine um, actually increases it. Um, atropine basically is a competitive, um, is a muscarinic um, ACTH receptor antagonist. And then what it does is that it blocks the cardio inhibitory input to the, uh, um, to the sinus uh, node. So what this means is that atropine basically transiently, um, it abolishes the cardio inhibitory um, carotid sinus hypersensitivity. So when you look at that question, it says enhances. Uh, so definitely that is not correct uh, because um, atropine actually abolishes the cardio inhibitory input um, to the sinus node. Now, um, the next is about the sinus arrest and then the sinus arrest uh, defined um, as a pause um, that is an exact multiple of the PP interval of the um, underlying reading. So, however, when we look at the sinus arrest, um, it, it's identified by a pause in the sinus reading. Um, and a PP interval surrounding the pause is not, is not a multiple of the underlying PP rate. Uh, so, but when we look at this, we see that it's an exact multiple of the a PP interval of the underlying rhythm, and that's false. Also, um, and now the question says that um, vasodilator, vasodepressor, carotid sinus hypersensitivity um, um, is defined at AC2 exceeding two seconds during carotid sinus massage. However, carotid sinus hypersensitivity is ventricular assist AC2. Uh, not just AC2, it's ventricular um, AC2 that is greater than three seconds. So not exceeding two seconds, is greater than three seconds uh, during carotid sinus stimulation or massage. Also in the respiratory form of um, sinus arrhythmia, 
um, they say um, the PP interval cyclically shortens during inspiration. Um, it's important to know that sinus arrhythmia um, is defined as um, um, physic variations in the uh, in the sinus circle length, and it can appear in two forms: um, respiratory and non-respiratory. But in the question, they are asking us about respiratory. And in the respiratory, the PP interval shortens um, in cyclical fashion um, during inspiration. And, and this is due to um, an inhibition of the vagal tone. Um, so basically, when we look at that, that in the respiratory form of sinus arrhythmia, the PP interval cyclically shortens during inspiration. And that answer is correct. So the correct question for 376 is definitely a D. Hello? We hear no? you, sir. Well, can, can I continue? In the absence of any questions, I think we can press ahead. Right. Okay, sorry, you, please, Dr. I want to ask something. Okay. Sorry, please, I want to ask you a question. Please go ahead, Ma. Concerning this sinus arrhythmia, there's something about it on ECG about, I don't know whether you came across it. I'm not too sure again, something about three small boxes for you to know. I don't know, I'm not too sure, but there's a way you know it on ECG. Like the variation should not be more than three boxes. More than 10%. Or is it that more than 10%. Be that? Okay, oh, I, didn't, I don't know about 10%. I think I know it in terms of boxes. Well, I can't remember, so I'm just asking whether you came across it. Thank you. Hello? 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 Yeah, are you hearing me? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Power on. Bluetooth mode. Paired. Doctor Vuda, we can hear you. Please, can you continue? I'm sorry. Uh, I think I'm not, I don't seem to be hearing you. Sorry, oh, so let me try. But we can hear you. Okay, I'm coming. I don't seem to be able to. All right. So please, I, I didn't. I didn't hear what he said. Please. She was talking about the sinus arrhythmia, that there is a definition for it on ECG, like something like three boxes or something like that. Well, I, I know I'll... what I usually, what I have seen before was about when there's a variation uh, uh, from the arrow arrow more than 10%. I think that's what I've seen before. I don't know whether anyone has seen anything like that. Yeah. Well, we can we can quickly browse and check it off. I will browse and check okay, it off. I think I'm seeing somewhere that arrow the arrow interval vary more than zero point one two one two zero point one two seconds. <laughs> yeah, that's more variation in PP interval of more than yes one two one twenty milliseconds. That's three small boxes. Yes, yes, yes. So, so it's the same thing. Arrow, arrow. Hello. Hello, it's PP yeah. interval. Variation in the PP interval. Is it PP or arrow arrow? Of more than 120 milliseconds. Okay, I've seen I'm seeing PP, I'm also seeing arrow arrow, which is co more correct. And you know, um, if you have a sinus rhythm, really, your RR interval and your PP interval in a normal um sinus rhythm, I think you mm. should also similar. Yes. Mm. Yes, but the problem with PR interval, that will not be the case, you get. Mm. So, mm. 
um, uh, will have variation in the PP interval more than 120 milliseconds. That's 0 0.12. Um, yeah. That's yes. equivalent to three small boxes. Box, yes. And sinus arrhythmia. And there are oh. other definitions too. We have okay. like three or four definitions. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you for so that thank means you. in okay. present of okay, sorry. Hello? Hello. Dr. Sorry, my yes. just trying to put that on the main group page so that we can check it there. Okay. Thank no you. Dr. Buddha, please let's continue. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very interesting class. 377. Which of the following statements? regarding ARVC is correct. So we are looking for the correct option. Um, VT in patients with ARVC typically has a right bundle branch uh, morphology. Uh, uh, typically, uh, the morphology um, is usually um, a left uh, bundle branch uh, morphology due to this right um, ventricular origin. Um, for uh, the uh, second one um, is ARVC is more common in women. And of course we know that um, it is more common in men um, compared um, um, to women. Also, um, and that question is fatty or fibrofatty infiltration of the right ventricle um, is the pathologic hallmark, and that is very true. Um, pathologic changes do not occur in uh, the uh, left ventricle, um, that is false. Um, and then radio frequency ablation is successful at preventing VT. We know that that is false, that um, it is usually, uh, that's why you need to put an, an ICD uh, to prevent uh, uh, cardiac death uh, because um, that is not uh, not feasible uh, to be able to admit um, every area where uh, this um, fibro fatty infiltration um, um, happens. So from our um, question, it looked uh, from the suggestions, the most appropriate um, would likely uh, be uh, the answer C, which is the fatty or fibro fatty infiltration um, of the right ventricle with the pathological uh, hallmark. And that is the most appropriate answer as regards this particular question. So thank you very much. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I just want to remind all of us here that we talked about Naxos disease earlier during the review of this book, so that I will remember that if we have kinky hair and um, palmopalma um, keratosis, and then I think affectation of the right ventricle, that we should be thinking of Naxos disease with ARCV, that we should think of Naxos disease. And I think there was one Kava Kajal syndrome too. Okay. Yeah. The, um, the mutation is still autosomal dominant, and they have they can also have kinky here and um, dharma, dharma manifestation. It's just to serve as a reminder. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So can we go ahead? Uh, in the absence of further comments, yes, please, sir. All right, so um, the next question brings us to 378. And um, a 62-year-old man with um, ischemic cardiomyopathy underwent a routine generator change um, of his implanted um, cardiovascular defibrillator two weeks ago. Now, just to note that uh, he now presents with mildly tender erythema. And of course, there is also a scant Lens image at the defibrillator pocket is afibrite and otherwise feels well and 
blood culture, grooming organisms. Also to note that the defibrillator leads were implanted 11 years prior uh, to this. So which of the following would be the best approach to management? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, first of all, just to note that um, that um, um, implanted electronic device, the infections, they are, they are increasing in incidence um, and they are usually more common after a generator change than at the initial time of implantation. So, and just to note that this patient, even if it happened two weeks prior to uh, the implantation of the generator, this patient has had, had his lead uh, present in 11 years. So he has had an 11 year old, uh, this thing, uh, 11 year old, and then of course, change the battery, which is within uh, battery change. And then of course, this patient was coming down um, with the mildly tender erythema and then scanned prolen drainage at the defibrillator pocket. Um, also to note that the organisms responsible for early infections are usually gram-positive cocci um, that is derived from the skin. Okay, predominantly staph, um, staph species are usually uh, um, the most common. And that is why it's very important that when we are doing this, um, we should really clean our sites. So um, pocket infection, they can present with pain and erythema. Uh, index patients had pain, had erythema. And also there was pool and discharge, which was scanty. Um, however, for this patient, there was no generator or lead erosion. Um, also imp important to know that for some patients, they may not go through this and they may have a septic uh, pulmonary emboli. And this can be just the first ma uh, manifestation of this. So it's important to know that uh, patients with um, evidence of an infection um, of a device um, including even if it's localized pocket infection uh, without evidence um, of systemic involvement. Uh, so in this patient, there was nothing to suggest the patient had a fever. Whether this happens or not, patients have to undergo complete removal of the system hardware. So for this patient, we are going to take up both the generator and the leads. Why? Because if this um, leads uh, um, stay for a long time, there is um, the risk of transvenous lead extraction increases uh, the longer the, uh, um, um, the uh, lead has been in place. So when we look at this, um, um, when we look at this, we and look at the question. So back to the question. So the guidelines and what is showing us is that for this patient, the patient has to have his lead uh, removed and extracted. So when we have look at this, the first is A, the generator should be explanted a new generator should be implanted using the old leads after a period of antibiotic therapy. From what our um, guidelines say, that's false. The generator should be explanted after a period um, of um, antibiotic therapy. A new system should be implanted on the contralateral side, leaving the abandoned leads in place. Um, also, um, the entire generator and lead system should be removed and a new system implanted on the contralateral side after a period of antibiotic therapy. Because the infection appears localized, a course of IV antibodies alone should be attempted. If evidence of infection will occur after antibiotic prevention should be removed, that's D, that's false. Needle aspiration of the pocket should be performed to isolate the organism responsible for the apparent infection prior to treatment decision, that's false. So for this, our answer is the entire generator and lead system removed and then a new system implanted on the contralateral side after a period of antibiotics uh, therapy. So thank you very much. So can we continue? Yes, please. Thank you. Hello? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Can I continue, Ma? Yes, please. Thank you very much. So we had um um yeah, going to 379. 379. Yes. Ma? 379. All right. So an 80-year-old man uh, with permanent rate controlled atrial fibrillation. So this patient has hypertension. 
patient has diabetes, patient has CKD, um, of course, uh, serum creatinine 2.5 milligram per DL and spinal stenosis had sustained three mechanical falls over the past year without serious injury. He has a history of occasional um, lower uh, GI bleeding uh, without a source of blood loss. Also, um, for the patient, um, identified by upper and lower, um, upper and lower, sorry, please, okay, upper and lower and capsule endoscopy. Of the following, which is the most appropriate method for stroke prevention? So for this patient, if we um, uh, take the chart that's two score, patient is 80 years, and so of course the, the score is already two. Uh, patient has hypertension, that's three already, diabetes, four. Uh, so uh, basically the patient has at least four, and with that, um, the patient qualifies for um, an anticoagulant. Uh, patient has passed just the use of um, antiplatelets. However, there is a challenge. What's the challenge? Uh, this patient is elderly. Um, patient has um, some kidney uh, abnormalities. Uh, patient also has um, an episode of bleeding. So for this patient, we want to balance that by a has blood score. So the patient has hypertension. Um, okay. Patient also has renal disease. The uh, the CRO is uh, serum creatinine is more than um, 2.2. Okay, patient, uh, there is no evidence of liver disease, no evidence of stroke. However, there is a prior history of bleeding. Uh, patient's um, um, age is more than 65 years. Um, and then medicines, patient has been definitely would have been on anticoagulants before, uh, based on the fact that the patient has had permanent weight controlled um, atrial fibrillation. Um, so we add that. So the patient has blood score is, is about five points. Um, and then of course, what it means in this context is that the risk of bleeding, um, the risk of bleeding is um, very increased for this patient. So, and um, when we look at that, because he has about five points, the risk about 9%. And what is the recommendation? Usually the recommendation using from the has blood score is that alternative to anticoagulation should be considered because of the patient's increased risk of bleeding. So we'll go back to the question. It says alternatives to anticoagulant should be considered. Aspirin, three to five milligram daily, that's not feasible because of course, as we said initially, this patient is um, has passed uh, using aspirin based on his chart vascular score. So we go to an um, 80 milligram twice daily, the same issue with the patient. We are having alternatives to anticoagulation should be considered. Apizabam, um, of course, apizabam is very appropriate for patient. In this context, this patient has um, CKD. Um, for this patient, if we are going to use apizabam, um, the five milligram twice daily will not be appropriate. Patient will benefit usually from um, 2.5 milligram for his age. And then apart from the age, also, um, um, you know, um, patients benefit because of the creatinine clearance. Also, um, um, ablation of the AV node, you know, that will not uh, stop uh, the issue on ground, is um, useful for symptomatic patients with AF and persistently rapidly ventricular rates, but the procedure uh, does not reduce the incidence of stroke for this patient. And then the most appropriate would be implantation of a left atrial appendage occlusion device. This will help us to um, definitely prevent a uh, risk of um, of um, um, of uh, the stroke, so that will uh, look um, like the most um, correct uh, answer. So thank you very much. Okay, sorry, I just want to add something. Okay. Or a summary of what you've just said. In patients with Chadvas uh, score greater or equal to two, with contraindication to long-term oral anticoagulation, um, bicutaneous left atrial appendage occlusion is indicated. So in yeah. essence, if patient has high risks of stroke and the patient has high risks of bleeding, this is recommended. Yeah. 
हेलो हेलो या 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 ओ से हेलो प्लीज व्हाट कैन कैन यू जस्ट व्हाट डॉक्टर क्रिस्टियाना व्हाट इज डॉक्टर क्रिस्टियाना से हेलो no no she was uh, hello she was talking no please uh, christina can, can you just repeat yourself please i can i was just yes i can hear you because so christina can you just recap the question of let each other think okay what i'm saying is i'm just recapping this trying to link this uh, case scenario with what is recommended according to the guidelines i'm saying that if patients have af and okay. the patient has af the patient has high risks of stroke and high risks of bleeding percutaneous okay. left atrial appendage occlusion device is recommended is a okay thank you thank you uh, and thank, thank you i appreciate yeah. thank you sir yeah, thank you you're welcome Good evening chief please I want to ask a question this patient that want to put the left atrial appendage occlusion device for when the patient require anticoagulation before inserting the left atrial appendage occlusion device or we are just going to use TE and then look if she if the patient has a clots and then if not we just put or don't the patient need anticoagulation before you put the device so wouldn't that still be an increased risk for the bleed that we have just said hello hello chief hello? i can hear you all right so so but basically um uh, at present uh these devices uh usually what we do is that uh before implantation uh there is a short term there has to be short term anticoagulation for 45 days uh followed by uh, the uh, that is transvaginal uh, confirmation that transvaginal echo conf uh, confirmation that there is no residual peri device flow so uh however just to note that um approximately um 95% of patients are able to discontinue anticoagulation at that time so basically even with the device patient will need to be on that anticoagulation for a short time before uh, you know before you stop finally okay chief thank you but the bleeding in call we've calculated the has blood score is high so when the patient yes, still have the risk of bleeding if we do yes. anticoagulation before the LEA no no it is we we'll do the LEA we we'll do the LEA and then continue the this thing for about 45 days and then we stop for because the the I think there is a trial is called I think that watchman or so watchman trial or so so uh but basically i think from what i what i what i saw i think i read it up from the back that's the answers i saw that um that's what, let me just read from what i i saw that says i am um, um one of one such us uh that is food and drug administration approved laa percutaneous occlusion device watchman a fenestrated fabric covered nitonol plug implanted via the femoral vein the transeptal catheterization was demonstrated to be non inferior to warfarin for stroke prevention with a lower risk of hemorrhagic stroke in long term follow up at present implantation of this device requires short term anticoagulation for 45 days followed by transesophageal echocardiographic confirmation that there is no residual peri device flow also to note that approximately 95% of patients are able to discontinue anticoagulation at that time so that means that when we put the device 
there will be a short-term anticoagulation for 45 days, and then followed by um, a transesophageal echocardiography. And then once there is no residual peri-device flow, patients are able to stop you know, uh, anticoagulation. Okay, thank you so much, Chief. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, the next question is, 30-year-old um, woman presents with, because of recurrent episodes of paroxysmal tachycardia, with dyspnea and, uh, and pre-syncope. Um, also to note that um, the intracardiac LACG electrograms at baseline A and during tachycardia are shown in figure 3.15. So we will go to that um, um, that intracardiac electrogram. We'll just see some interesting things. Okay, let me try and go to the diagram. Okay, so we we see that there is a baseline intracardiac electrogram, and then of course there is a one that there is tachycardia. Okay, so we have basically uh, the V1, V5. The V1 and V5, like we said, there is usually a complementary um, ECG um, so that it can give, give us um, context um, when uh, we are dealing with um, the intracardiac electrograms. And then we see the HROA, which is a high um, right atria. Uh, that's where the, uh, the lead is placed. And then we see that we have the, the coronary sinus. And then uh, we have the different ones, the ones that are proximal. So usually from the proximal to uh, the distal. And then we have the coronary sinus, we have the distal. So um, also uh, the his bundle, uh, we have the distal. And then we have the his proximal. And then of course we have the, uh, the right ventricular apex. So we look very, first of all, we look very well at the QRS complex. And of course, we find out that ideally, the, the right atrium should um, um, uh, depolarize uh, before the QRS complex, which is what we are seeing um, at the baseline. So we, we watch the HRO, we watch the, uh, the uh, coronary sinus prosima. Um, of course, that has three, three parts there, the, from the most prosimal to the least prosimal. And then we have the coronary sinus distal. And then, of course, we have the his distal and then the his prosima and then we talk about the ROV apex. Okay, so when we look again at the one that is having tachycardia, we see something interesting. Now, if you look at the V1 to the V5, uh, V1, V5, you see that the um, the QRS complex is uh, at sharp, and then we are not really appreciating um, a, a P wave. Um, let me see whether the we we'll go back and see whether we are anyone is following to show that. So it is mostly all right. So we go back to the QRS complex. So I'm, I've left the baseline. I'm right now at the um, the tachycardic area. So one of the things we find out that basically is that the uh, the um, it's a narrow complex. That's for the V1 V5. Now the interesting thing, however, is that unlike in the previous one, we find out that the HROA is depolarizing after the ventricle. If you look at the baseline, HROA, the depolarization was before the, uh, the QRS complex. However, in the tachycardia, we are now seeing that the HROA is depolarizing after the, um, the QRS depolarizes. You can see it consistently, unlike the previous one, where it depolarized before the uh, QRS complex. Also, we see that the prosimal, the same thing is happening. The prosimal CS, they are all depolarizing uh, before the, um, the uh, sorry, depolarizing after the QRS complex. So uh, that points to the fact that there is something happening, uh, which is the fact that, that it's very possible that the ventricular activation occurs well before the depolarization of the his blocking fiber, as you can see, in the uh, uh, in the uh, electrogram, and so when this happens, uh, this demonstrates that 
um, also look at the ventricular deposition at the his and the ROV apical, you find out that it corresponds uh, to the ventricular depolarization. So it suggests that there is actually, um, um, there just actually uh, looks like there is um, an accessory pathway. So that is what is pointing because we are seeing that when the tachycardia is happening, rather than the HROA and the cis prosimal depolarization, depolarizing before the QRS complex, they seem to depolarize after the QRS complex. And that's a pointer of the fact that it's very possible there are some accessory uh, pathway. So when we go to the equations, we just find that as our equation, that what is happening is there ablation of the atrioventricular slow pathway, ablation of accessory pathway, implantation of an automatic cardioverter defibrillator, direct current cardioversion followed by long-term anticoagulation with warfarin, no further therapy. And from what we see, the most appropriate uh, seems to be ablation of um, an accessory uh, pathway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gunda. That's quite lucid. So I think I'm done. I, uh, I think I think this is my last question, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. The next presenter, please. This is 9.42. Yes. So Hello. good evening. Yep. Yeah. I'm here. Excuse me. Dr. Uzoke, you wanted to say something? No, nothing. I said I was no. Okay, okay. So I'm taking 381 to 390. Uh, Chipsa, oh, I to 381. I hope we still have some brain juice left. If you're asleep, <laughs> stand up and just take 10 or 15 steps, then go back and sit down. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Oh. Okay. It's like Dr. Sarah has those double. <laughs> yeah, it's stuck on the image. Dr. Sarah? Wow. Is it possible for someone to share? Yes. Let me try. Yes, I think so. Just that I think it needs to share. Dr. Sawa. Dr. Sawa. Wow. I'm calling him. I'm calling him. Okay. Thank you, Ma. Okay, thank you. I see the screen moving. Um, do you want to continue sharing? Oh, you want me to put it up, Dr. Okay, I think I
So I think this is visible, yeah? Yes, please. Okay. So question 381 um, says, which of the following statements about congenital long QT syndromes is true? Of course, we remember that the QT interval can be excessively prolonged and we could have congenital types or um, acquired causes. And the congenital types are mainly channelopathies. Um, so there are up to 17, I think, subtypes based on the mutations and some other um, characteristics they have. So long QT, one, two, three, account for the majority of cases. And long QT, one and two, are due to loss of function mutations in... I'm so sorry, my nephews are around for a sleepover and they're just emerging. So um, long QT1 and 2 are due to loss of function mutation in different potassium channels, while long QT3 is a gain of function mutation in sodium channel. Um, they have identified triggers that cause um, degeneration to tosad and uh, subsequent syncope, so or other cardiac events. So long QT1 tend to have events mainly during exercise, especially swimming and severe emotional distress. So looks like, um, you know, sympathetic a stimulation type of thing. Long QT2 have a high um, yeah, rate of events when they have loud acoustic events. So when there's some really loud sound or something like that. And long QT3 tend to have events during sleep. So let's go through the um, options. Uh, a says, most forms of long QT syndromes result from mutations in gene that code for proteins in cardiac calcium channels. So we're looking for one true answer. So this is not true. Calcium channels are not the, I mean, the, it's mainly potassium and sodium channels. So B, long QT1 patients experience a high frequency of cardiac events during swimming. This is true. Physical activity, especially swimming, many of the patients tend to have um, events during swimming. So this is the true answer. Sudden loud acoustic events are a common trigger of syncope in long QT3. This is false. Acoustic events are a common trigger in long QT2, not 3. Um, cardiac events during sleep are common in patients with long QT2. So they interchange this. So cardiac events during sleep are common in long QT3. All right. So any comments, contributions before we move to the next? Okay, carrying on. Yes. Um, oh. Okay. So 382, which of the following statements regarding mm -hmm. sudden cardiac death is not correct? So we're looking for one false answer. So going through the options, A says there are over early B says the peak incidence of sudden cardiac death among adults is between the ages of 45 and 75. C, hereditary causes hereditary causes of sudden cardiac death include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, long QT syndrome, ARVC, and Brugada syndrome. Um, D, sudden cardiac death is more common in women than men. And E, um, an interventricular conduction abnormality on the ECG is a stronger predictor of sudden cardiac death than, find, than findings of left ventricular hypertrophy. So we're looking for one false answer. So A is statistics from the US. It is true that there are up to over 350,000 sudden cardiac deaths in the US. Um, the peak incidence in adults is for five to 75 years. There's the peak incidence in children. There's that in um, neonates. Um, hereditary causes, we've already mentioned some of them. This is true. C is true. 
D, sudden cardiac death is more common in women than men. This is false because um, sudden cardiac death tends to be more common in men than women. And it's sort of a reflection of the epidemiology of ischemic heart disease and acute coronary syndromes, which in the US uh, and probably like other places in premenopausal women is less frequent than in men. And then the gap closes up uh, postmenopausally. So sudden cardiac death is more common in men. Uh, e from Framingham study, an IVCD on ECG was a stronger predictor of sudden cardiac death than LVH. So uh, comments or contributions, additions, before we move on. Yeah, just to agree with the point uh, on the uh, sudden cardiac deaths being commoner in uh, men compared to women, and it is even much more uh, before the age of 65, then uh, subsequently after that, men still die of sudden cardiac death compared to women, but the ratio drops uh, further. So generally, yeah, it's more in men. Uh, before age 40, uh, 65, it is much more higher in men uh, compared to women. And even after that age, it's still more, but the um, frequency uh, sort of reduces. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff Atubi. So moving on to 383, uh, it says all of the following are likely in a patient with the ECG shown in figure 316, except. So let's probably look at figure 316. Can we all see it? Yes. It's okay. So it's a short strip. Uh, the lead is not labeled. Um, we'll have a short strip of a couple of seconds. Um, we see P wave, QRS in the first. P wave, QRS T. We see another P wave, QRS T. Then there's a couple of um beads that appear as if they do not have P waves, or maybe they're buried. And then subsequently, we see other ones. Um, so it's an atrial tachycardia. But I'll confess that um, when I went back to check the answer, they said it's an atrial tachycardia with a block. Um, anyone who wants to help explain that could volunteer when we've answered, please. So um, the options say which of the following are likely in a patient with the ECG we've just seen, except so all would be true. We're looking for one false answer. So a gradual increase in atrial rate with administration of digoxin. It is said that this particular type of arrhythmia is um, one of the presentations of digoxin toxicity. And if digoxin is continued, so if digoxin is continued despite this um, rhythm, then the atrial rate tends to continue increasing. B, an irregular atrial rate. This is also true. C, precipitation of the arrhythmia by hypokalemia. This is also true. D, absence of underlying cardiac disease. This is not true. Most patients that would present with it would have some underlying cardiac disease, probably an ischemic heart disease or something else. Then E, frequent ventricular prematurity. So they could have... a uh, PVCs. So the answer is um, is D. So please, who can help out with any further any further explanations or clarifications? Okay. Uh, sorry. What I'm thinking, I'm not too sure, but I'm thinking the reason why they added the block is because. Maybe the uh, okay. What I'm thinking, maybe they added the block. I'm not too sure. Maybe because some of these ones, maybe from one, two, three, four. Yes, the third, fourth, fifth don't have a P wave or something. Could it be the reason why they're saying yeah. that there's a block there? Probably, possibly. 
I mean, the, the complexes are narrow, so it's it's not like, it doesn't look like yeah, there's a right on yeah. branch block. Yes. And it doesn't appear as if there's aberrant C, i.e. LBB or RBB. So I wasn't sure which block they meant. Yeah. Do you guys want us to read the explanation? Or... Yes, I think we can. Hello. Are we sleeping? Yeah. Hello. Let me look yes, at please. Please, let's read okay. this. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Thank you. So let me let me go there. I guess people are tired. Yeah, definitely. To the end of the week. I'm sure if I wasn't presenting, I might have done stuff. So. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Okay, so let me read. So they said the answer is um, D that the ECG illustrated shows atrial tachycardia with block. In this condition, an atrial rate of 130 to 200 beats per minute with a ventricular response less than or equals to the atrial rate is present. Digitalis toxicity accounts for this rhythm in 50 to 75% of cases. And in such instances, the atrial rate may show a gradual increase if digoxin is continued. Other signs of digitalis excess are often present, including frequent PVCs. In nearly one half of all patients with atrial tachycardia with block, the atrial rate is irregular and demonstrate a characteristic isoelectric interval between each P wave in contrast to the morphology of atrial flutter. So yes, we, we saw an isoelectric um, PR interval. Most instances of this rhythm occur in patients with significant organic heart disease. So that's what made defaults that uh, they said there was absence of underlying heart disease. Causes other than digitalis toxicity include ischemic heart disease, MI, and corpulmonale. In patients taking digitalis, potassium depletion may precipitate the arrhythmia. So we know we, we don't want to give digoxin to patients with hypokalemia. And the oral administration of potassium and withholding of digoxin often will allow reversal to sinus rhythm. Because atrial tachycardia with block is seen primarily in patients with serious underlying heart disease, its onset may lead to significant clinical deterioration. So they still didn't exactly mention what the block was, but that is the explanation. Uh, so, uh, uh, Deandre, maybe we could uh, note the question if we could get uh, further input from our teachers. Sure, sure. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. So question 384, still on sudden cardiac death. Um, which of the following statements regarding sudden cardiac death in patients with coronary artery disease is correct? So before we go into the options, the overwhelmingly common cause or the most overwhelmingly frequent cause of sudden cardiac death is ischemic heart disease. I mean, especially in the West, and this is US, I mean, the book, is mainly based on US data. Um, uh, and among patients with sudden cardiac death, majority would have had an MI. Um, so option A says sudden cardiac death accounts for 10% of all coronary artery disease. We're looking for one correct answer, mind you. So this is incorrect. Sudden cardiac death accounts for over, I think about 50% of all coronary artery disease. So those that make it to the hospital are just like half of the people that have an ACS. And um, of if we so if we take a hundred patients with coronary artery disease, half would about half or more would have sudden cardiac death. Um, then if we take 
100 patients with sudden cardiac death, about 80, that's 80%, would be due to ischemic heart disease or ischemic coronary events. So A is false. The percentage is much higher. B, compared with white Americans, African Americans have a higher age-adjusted incidence of sudden cardiac death. This is true. African Americans throughout all age um, ranges have a higher incidence of sudden cardiac death compared to whites. Um, I didn't try to dive into finding the explanations, but might include um, access to care and things like that. Uh, C, the most common mechanism of cardiac arrest is acetone. This is false. The most common mechanism of cardiac arrest is ventricular fibrillation, mm. followed by asystole or bradycardia, so asystole, followed by pulseless electrical activity and then sustained VTAC. So if you remember the four peri-arrest rhythm, rhythms, the two shockable and the two non-shockable, so I don't know if we were to try to do a, a memory aid, the two shockable ones are the most common and the least common. So VFib is the most common, v um, VTAC is the least. Then in between, we have asystole and um, pulseless electrical activity. So D, the outcome of patients with bradycardic slash asystolic out of hospital cardiac arrest is better than if ventricular tachycardia is the initial arrhythmia. So the, the rhythm with the best outcome for out of hospital cardiac arrest is actually ventricular tachycardia. Asystole has very poor outcome when it occurs as out of hospital cardiac arrest. Then E successfully resuscitated ventricular fibrillation during the first 48 hours of an acute MI, identifies uh, individuals at increased risk of future sudden cardiac death and warrants ICD. So ICD, this is false. For patients who have had an MI, um, ventricular arrhythmias occurring within the immediate post-MI period are not indications for ICD. It's if much later, when they're convalescent, they continue to have uh, ventricular tachyarrhythmias, then that's when they are candidates for ICD. Okay. Any comments or clarifications, contributions? So, sorry to take you back. Uh, what was your comment on uh, option C? C. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, option C says that the most common mechanism of cardiac arrest is asystole. This is false because the most common mechanism of cardiac arrest is actually ventricular fibrillation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Followed, followed by asystole. So asystole is the second most common then pulseless electrical activity, then sustained VTAC. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any inputs? Okay, yeah. let me move on. Uh, is there any other comments? Please, let's continue. Okay, so we'll continue. Still, I'm reiterating, if you're dozing, stand up, walk, take 10 steps and clap your hands 10 times or something. <laughs> so, question 385. Um, a 62-year-old woman with permanent atrial fibrillation takes the abigatran 150 milligrams twice daily for stroke prevention. 30 minutes ago, she sustained trauma in a motor vehicle collision and was stabilized at the scene, then rapidly transported to the nearby emergency department. Upon arrival, she is unresponsive, intubated, and hypotensive. Computer tomography demonstrates a small intracranial subdural hematoma and a retroperitoneal hemorrhage that requires urgent exploratory laparotomy. Which of the following is the most appropriate method to, to reverse anticoagulation in this patient with life-threatening bleeding in need of emergency surgery? So, of course, we know uh, dabigatran is one of the NOAX or DOAX, and um, it's a direct thrombin inhibitor. 
it it acts uh so when it came out when it came out it did not have an antidote um when it was launched until mm -hmm. around 2015 when when idarisuzumab was um approved by fda as a successful antidote for uh, dabigatran so if one tries to look at papers or whatever about dabigatran related bleeding prior to 2015 um, one would find like a barrage of uh, measures being taken yeah. but none would include idarisuzumab so this kind of revolutionized it was very found to be very effective and is produced by the same company that yes. produces dabigatran so um so if we have so dabigatran in this oh, patient it it can we mute i think there's somebody okay. is that already the one I'm I'm unconscious someone asking for oh. i yes. gave the husband to somebody mic did he show you i told yes. him to show you okay. done muted already okay thank you so um dabigatran related bleeding could occur from let's say overdose for instance or in this case somebody taking their normal dose but now needing uh, coming with life threatening bleeding from trauma or needing um, emergency surgery so if there's the bigatran overdose i saw a case report of a patient that swallowed 125 capsules so that's really bad so if it's within 4 hours of onset if the patient results within 4 hours of ingestion they could have um, activated charcoal with gastric lavage to remove the drug. If it's more than that, it won't work. Then hemodialysis is also something that could be done. It, it's able to remove dabigatran from the system. But IV darisuzumab 5 milligram stat is able to mop up. It's a monoclonal antibody directed against dabigatran, and it's able to mop it up from the system within minutes. Typically, one dose is given. But um, uh, I've seen a few places where people had to give additional dose. Then some blood products like uh, four-factor prothrombin concentrate can also be used. Uh, there are other things like fever and a couple of others. So anyways, in this patient, she came with life-threatening bleeding. She needs emergency surgery. And uh, there's need to reverse its effects quickly. So the options are vitamin K, 10 milligram intravenously. Of course, we know vitamin K does nothing for dabigatran. B, oral activated charcoal. We don't know when last she took the dabigatran, and it's not really an overdose. We just need to get it out of the system. So B is also not correct. C, idarisuzumai, 5 grams intravenously. Sorry, I said 5 milligrams. It's 5 grams earlier. 5 grams IV. This is the correct answer because she needs surgery emergently and um, the effects need to be reversed to prevent further bleeding and uh, excessive post-op bleeding. So this C is the correct answer. Then D, hemodialysis. So although hemodialysis can remove the time from the system, but these patients need to be taken for an emergency surgery. So hemodialysis wouldn't be the appropriate option at this moment. So who has anything to add, please? Uh, thank you very much, Ruki. Uh, just a question. From administration to um, reversing this effect, any study to show how long it takes? So I don't have exact figures, but uh, where I read it said within minutes. Within minutes. It's able thank to mop up. Yes, it's over, it binds to. So dabigatran is Pradaxa and um, the darisuzumab is Prax bind. So it binds to dabigatran and renders it ineffective within minutes. Mm. Okay, thank you. Very much. You're welcome, thank you. So moving on. Yes, let's move on. So 386 says, which of the following patients is the most appropriate candidate 
for placement of an invert implantable cardioverter defibrillator for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death. So the primary is relevant. Uh, for ICD implantation, there's hardly any, I mean, the secondary for secondary prevention, the indications are not that difficult. I mean, anybody who has survived or has been successfully resuscitated from a cardiac arrest is eligible for an ICD for the most part. But the primary, um, I mean, indications for primary prevention. So A says a 45-year-old man, one week after acute myocardial infarction, with the ventricular ejection fraction at 5% and NIHA class 3 symptoms. So patients who have had an MI do not get an ICD until they're reassessed uh, about 40 days after the event. So this one says one week after, so it's too soon. So this patient is not an appropriate candidate for an ICD. Option B says a 66-year-old woman. So I'll read the all, all of them then. So a 66-year-old woman with history of non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, LVEF of 30, so it's less than 35. If we, are, if we recall the indication for heart failure, this is less than 35, so LVEF is 30. Despite medical therapy with ACIs and beta blocker for the past six months. So we'll come back to her. C, 22-year-old man who presents with chest pain and reduced LVEF of 50%, who has a normal surface ECG but evidence of myocarditis on CMR, uh, cardiac, magnet cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. So myocarditis is not an um, indication for ICD. Uh, it's hopefully reversible, or, but at this at this stage, this patient is not eligible. Um, D, 78-year-old man with history of ischemic cardiomyopathy, LVEF of 30%, end-stage renal disease on dialysis, and recently diagnosed metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. So when given an ICD, patients that are expected to live for at least a year with the device are selected. So this patient has so many morbidities with poor prognosis that his life expectancy may not reach a year. So this patient is not an ideal candidate for ICD. Then E, 52-year-old man with history of alcoholism and newly recognized LVEF of 20% and NIHA class 2 symptoms. So we're not given a lot of detail, but Likely, this person, uh, patient's alcoholism might be the cause of their um, systolic dysfunction and symptoms. So this is a potentially reversible cause. And the patient is also not a suitable candidate for ICD. So the suitable candidate of all of these is this number, uh, option B, the 66-year-old woman with history of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and LVE of, of 30%. Despite medical therapy with ACEIs and beta blockers for six months. So, any inputs? Please continue, ma'am. Oh, okay. sorry. I would like to make a comment on this question, please. Hi. Sure, sure. Hi, Hola. Please. Hola. I have yeah. a question about the answer to this question. The patient is on AC inhibitors oh. and, beta, and beta blockers. That means he's not on the full guideline directed medical therapy. Yeah. Would this patient yeah. still be? Was is this still an indication for IC, um, ICD if he's not even getting the full guideline directed medical therapy? I don't know. I share the same sentiments actually because I yeah. I kept checking through the options and trying to find which one is most appropriate. But when I check the answer, so that's why I said in among these options, options. If, if there were a different set of options, then she may not be eligible. There would be somebody else that would be more eligible if you get my... Okay. If you get my... Okay, I get what you're saying. So among, okay. yeah, among all of these five patients that were listed, she is the most appropriate. But yes, she's not on all of the guideline-directed therapy. 
we don't know if there are contraindications to them for some reason. Sure. It wasn't mentioned. Sure. Yes. So she's yeah. not on optimal medical treatment yet. Yeah. But among the cohort, she has the best, she fits the indication the most. Right. So remember, it's best of five, right? Not necessarily right. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. So moving on 387, again, we come back to the pacemaker issues. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Somebody wanted to speak. Yes, okay. I also so heard. Yeah, speak. I heard someone trying to speak, yeah. but I, I can't see any mics on at the moment. Let me carry on, please. Whoever it is, you could stop. You know, stop me and make your comments or questions. So 387, which of the following statements regarding cardiac pacing modes is correct? Now, pacing modes, we know have this three or four letter nomenclature, which the first letter um, represents the chamber that is paced. The second letter represents the chamber that is sensed. Memory hack, P comes before S in the alphabet. So if we're doing an alphabetical order. So the chamber that is paced comes first. Then the chamber that is sensed is the second letter. Then what the pacemaker does, I, I, that's the response. Does it inhibit or does it trigger? That's the third letter. Then you could have a fourth letter to show if there is rate responsiveness in patients who have chronotropic incompetence. So the pacemaker can pick up like increased um, activity from things like um, increase in minute ventilation from the lungs and things like that. And then also increase its pace to match kind of the level of activity. So there can be a, manner, a number of combinations uh, but the three most common used modes uh, in recent times are VVI, AAI, and DDD. So dual chamber pacing, dual chamber sensing, and dual action. So it could either inhibit or trigger as is needed. So option A says ventricular inhibited pacing. So that's VVI restores and maintains atrioventricular synchrony. This is not true because this is a single chamber type of pacing. It paces the ventricle, it senses the ventricle, so it's got no business with the atria. So it, there will not be AV synchrony. And in this sort of patient, you could have the ventricle contracting with the atrium and giving us the, I think, you know, so, there is no AV synchrony. It's a simple, it's simply, it's businesses with the ventricle. So A is false. B says VVI pacing provides rate responsiveness in the chronotropically incompetent patient. Uh, is VVI R. So the R is not missing the R for rate responsiveness. So this is not true. VVI on its own doesn't, um, give rate responsiveness on, until that setting is also um, put in the mode. C says single chamber triggered pacing. That's AAT. So senses the atrium, paces the atrium, and it triggers. So every time it senses activity in the atrium, it also triggers an impulse. Or VVT, so same thing for the ventricle, increases the drain on the pacemaker battery, yes, because each time it senses, it paces. It triggers an activity. So C is the correct answer. The single chamber triggered uh, modes drain the battery quicker. And frankly, they're not commonly used, I think, in modern times, except if there's specific indications for them. D, but I mean, I'm sure we'll get this all better cleared up when we have the lecture with Prof. Vladimir So D, um, atrial inhibited pacing is an appropriate mode of pacing for patients with AV nodal dysfunction. Atrial inhibited pacing, that's AAI, I'm guessing, 
it's got nothing to do with the AV node and the ventricle. So if a patient has AV nodal dysfunction, AAI will not really help them. Then E, dual chamber pacing and sensing with inhibition and tracking is preferred mode of pacing for patients in atrial fibrillation. So I've forgotten the explanation for this, but it's not. DDD is not the default preferred mode for atrial fibrillation. Uh, it says that it is said that modern pacemakers tend to have um there could be, oh yes uh, so if it's if it senses both atria and ventricle then the excessive atrial um atrial activity in the yeah the excessive atrial activity because of atrial fibrillation would be sensed sense sense like you know it's really fast so the pacemaker could just keep um pacing 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 and. It would just be one big chaotic mess. So there are modern pacemakers that have a setting that allows them to um, detect like atrial fibrillation and switch off the atrial sensing in such scenarios. So E is also false. So the correct answer here is C, that single chamber triggered pacing, that is AAT or VVT, increases the drain on pacemaker battery. But I'm sure we look forward to learning more about this when we have the lecture. But whoever has something to add, please go ahead. Okay, let me just add that the <clears throat> dual chamber pacing, the uh, DDD, is, is a preferred mode you know, for patients that have uh, a combination of sinus and um, AV dysfunction. So when patients have, you know, of course it's dual chamber, so it has to be uh, involving both chambers. So when there's um, combined sinus and AV dysfunction, the DDD is actually uh, much preferred to use. Then for the VVI, like you, you mentioned, that one, it, it can protect against, you know, bradycardia, but it does not have capacity to either restore or maintain the AV asynchrony. Uh, so what you have commonly with the VBI is the uh, AV dissociation. It's very common in them because they cannot restore or maintain uh, AV synchrony. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So question 388. Which of the following statements regarding cardiac pacemakers is not correct? Okay. So not correct. So we're looking for one false answer. Hyper A, hyperkalemia results in pacing and sensing threshold abnormalities. This is true. Um, Because, I mean, we know the cells and tissue have action potential and all of that that is altered by, that is caused by the flow of you know ion sodium potassium and all of them uh so if there is an imbalance or excessive ghee high or low then they could affect the pacing and sensing threshold so a is correct so that's not the answer since we're looking for one false answer B, lead dislodgement or inadequate initial lead placement should be suspected if true under sensing is present. This is true because the leads have to be properly paced to sense properly. C, cellular telephones do not cause clinically important pacemaker interference during normal use. This is also true. Simply using a cell phone, as in holding it to one's ear and making a phone call, or using a hands-free device or whatever, doesn't typically affect uh, pacemakers, but it is discouraged for uh, patients who have a pacemaker to carry their cell phones in the breast pocket, if lateral to where the pacemaker was, you know, inserted. So they shouldn't carry it in the same, in the same, um, in the same on the same side, like continuously having contact. Uh, other things that could affect pacemaker functions include, uh, you know, those those there these sensors typically in the doors at the doors of 
stores or supermarkets or whatever that are able to detect if one is trying to go out with products they've not paid for. So um, patients with pacemaker should be educated not to lean on or stand there for too long. I mean, just passing in and out doesn't affect their pacemaker, but leaning on it or standing adjacent to it for too long could um, be problematic. So C is true. Normal cellular phone use doesn't affect, doesn't interfere with the pacemaker. I mean, or give any clinically important interference. So D, right bundle branch block is the expected electrocardiographic pattern during right ventricular pacing. This is false. Since the right ventricle is being paced, then it's a left bundle branch pattern that would um, be expected. So D is false. So this is the incorrect answer, and this is the answer for the question. Um, e, pseudo fusion on the surface ECG is identified by an appropriately timed pacing stimulus that does not alter the morphology of a simple imposed intrinsic QRS. So this is also true. Even though there's some um, explanation around what pseudo fusion is and all of that, that is not very forthcoming at this time. <laughs> I'm also struggling to stay awake. Uh, so, if there are any inputs for 388, please come forward. Okay, if there's none, I move on. 389 says the finding on the chest radiograph on figure 3.1.7 um, would be associated with which of the following measurements on device interrogation. So I will show the image, but looking at the options, we see things around threshold and lead impedance. Um, so impedance derived from the English word impede means to like obstruct or slow down, you know, something. So leads um, have certain level of slowing down or obstruction to the flow of current. And um, there's a formula, I think is the voltage over the current. Yes. Uh, so, so, the threshold, voltage threshold, and the lead impedance are used to diagnose different causes of uh, pacemaker dysfunction. Because, I mean, if a pacemaker, sorry, malfunction, if a pacemaker is malfunctioning, you don't want to have to go to remove the whole thing to know what is happening. You would like to know what's happening so that you could solve the specific issue. So, ranging from lead dislodgement, um, um, problems with the insulation of the lead, um, lead fracture and things like that. All of them have particular pattern of what they give with regards to the voltage threshold and the lead impedance. So let's look at the image. This is the image in question. Is it visible? Hello. Yes, it is. Yes, we can see. Okay. We can see. Right. Okay. okay, fine. So we see a pacemaker with a single lead. And where my arrow is pointing, there's a lead fracture. There's a lead fracture where my arrow is pointing. Um, if it's not very clear, you could still go look at the book when you have time. Let me just zoom. Right here, there's a lead fracture. So even if we're to kind of try to employ basic logic, too, if you have discontinuity in a pipe or a conduit for something, then likely there would be some obstruction to the flow. So lead fracture gives high impedance, high lead impedance, and it also has high voltage threshold because some of the current is being lost to the surrounding tissue, you know? So um, uh, if the insulation, the lead insulation for the pacemaker has a problem, then 
the impedance will be low because now apart from the lead itself, surrounding tissue can also um, transmit the current, you know? Um, so uh, going back to the question options. Alhamdulillah, and our life here. And as well, and enter our life here. Like that, so good. So I'm not sure what's in the way. But what's not? Okay, okay. I'll try him that I can already. Watch out. You're welcome. Day, Andrew. Inshallah, eh, I will thank you, sir. Yeah. Mm, Dr. Hoffa, can you mute? Yeah. Uh, this is being recorded. Thank you very much. Rukayat, go ahead now. Go ahead, please. I think it has. I think she dropped out of the meeting. Wow. Wow, wow. She was, so I hope you are stand, standing by. She was almost done. My apologies, my network just went off without warning. Let me reshare. You're welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Yes, sorry for that. So I was saying, um, the different lead problems will give different uh, impedance and voltage thresholds, but the fracture will give higher impedance because it impedes the flow of current and would result in higher voltage threshold. So let's go through the options. A says um, high voltage threshold, high lead impedance. This is the correct answer. B says low voltage threshold, high lead impedance. That's not correct. C says high voltage threshold, low lead impedance. Uh, D, low voltage threshold, low lead impedance. This is seen when there's um, insulation problems. Insulation of the lead removes or something. Then E, high voltage threshold, normal lead impedance. I think this is seen in um, lead dislodgement. But again, the pacemaker things will become clearer when we have our lecture about those case. So any input here? So moving on to the last question. Question 390, which of the following is not associated with 
the ECG abnormality displayed in figure 3.18. So going to figure 3.18, So we see a full ECG, 12 lead ECG with V1 as the rhythm strip. Um, of course, at first glance, we see wide complexes um, that are not of the same size or morphology throughout. Uh, we also see some irregularity then in leads V4, V5, V6, there appears to be something that looks like a delta wave. My cursor is trying to show them. Uh, so, okay, somewhere there, I'm going to the remainder too. So this is uh, atrial fibrillation with wolf Parkinson right? Um, uh, well, let, let's go back to the options. Where is the reason? So 390, which of the following is not associated with the ECG abnormality in figure 3.18, not associated. So A, absence of underlying structural heart disease in most adults. B, beneficial response to treatment with forapamil. C, an association with Epstein anomaly. D, higher prevalence in men. And E, right, posterior septal pathway. So we try to eliminate. We know that B, we don't give verapamil because it's an AV nodal blocking agent. And if we block the AV node, then we will accelerate transmission through the accessory pathway. So that takes out B. C, an association with Epstein anomaly. This is very true. Accessory pathway arrhythmias. And SVTs are common in Epstein anomaly. So this is true. So we're looking for one false answer. Um, absence of underlying structural heart disease in most adults. This is false. Most adults that would have... Um, where is it? Yes, this is false. Then D, higher prevalence in men and right posterior septal pathway. So apparently, and this is not something I'm very conversant with, the direction of the QRS complexes in the leads gives away the direction of the pathway. So this is a posterior septal pathway, right posterior septal pathway, because the um, QRSs in leads two, three, and AVF are predominantly negative. But we could go read up the answer if we would like to mm -hmm. understand it better. Hello, do we want to read the answer or we just take the question? You can read the answer. Okay. Sorry, the answer was B. I didn't even... So let's read. Um, the ECG in figure 
in the figure depicts an atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate and aberrant conduction in a patient with wolf parkinson white syndrome and a right posteroceptal pathway. The latter localization is possible because of the negative initial deflections in lead 2, 3 AVF and V1 with upright initial forces in lead 1 and AVF. So this suggests a posteroceptal pathway. IQ treatment of this dysrhythmia should include agents that prolong refractoriness in the accessory pathway, such as IV procainamide or ibutilide. In hemodynamically unstable patient, DC cardioversion is the treatment of choice. IV verapamil prolongs conduction time in the AV node without affecting conduction through the accessory pathway. Thus, administration of verapamil to a patient with WPW in AF may accelerate conduction through the bypass tract and precipitate ventricular fibrillation. So it's not appropriate to use it in this setting. Um, electrocardiographic evidence of WPW is present in approximately 25% of healthy individuals. So that, that was my error. A, a is true, B is the false answer. Um, Three basic EC three basic features characterize the ECG abnormalities of this syndrome. The presence of PR interval less than 120 milliseconds during sinus rhythm, QRS duration greater than 120 milliseconds with a slurred, slowly rising onset of QRS in some leads. This is the delta wave. So it doesn't have to be in all leads, it could be in some leads. And secondary STT wave. Uh, changes generated directly opposite to the major QRS vector. The axis of the delta waves on the surface ECG <coughs> can be used to localize the position of the accessory pathway in the heart. Left free wall accessory pathways are the most common, followed by posteroceptal, right free wall, and anteroceptal locations. The prevalence of WPW is higher in men and it decreases with age. So it decreases with age, not increase, unlike many of the other arrhythmias like ACO. Most associated dysrhythmias are reciprocating, i.e. reentrant trichipadias, in 80%, with 15 to 30% presenting as AF and 5% as atrial quota. Although most adults with WPW have normal hearts, a number of cardiac defects are associ occasionally associated with this syndrome, including Epstein anomaly. In patients with Epstein anomaly, multiple accessory pathways are often present and are located on the right side of the heart with pre-excitation localized to the atrialized ventricle. So that brings me to the end of my assigned questions. Any contributions or comments? Thank you very much, Rokaya. Thank you, Chief Ozoku. Please, may you continue to share for us why um, subsequent presenters move on? Okay, that's fine. So the, the answer, the wrong answer, which is the answer for the question, is this beneficial response to treatment with therapy? Okay, good evening once again, everyone. Am um, I audible? Very well, Chief Sawa. Go ahead, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Um, so I'm taking um, three, it's three, nine, one. Uh, okay, three nine one says a sixty five year old diabetic man with a history of myocardial infarction presents for evaluation. He is known to have a left ventricular injection fraction of thirty percent with anterior wall hypokinesis. It's comfortable at rest, but 
report this near with simple household activities and cannot accent flights of flight of stairs without stopping to catch his breath. He does not describe chest discomfort and there is no evidence of reversible ischemia by exercise scintigraphy. His current medical regimen includes covered about 25 milligrams twice daily, sacro butyl basatan 4951 milligram twice daily, plus 20 milligram daily, spirolactone 25 milligram daily, and empagliflozin 10 milligram daily. His physical examination reveals blood pressure of 158 millimeter of mercury, heart rate of 68 beats per minute, normal JV particular venous pressure and clear lungs to auscultation. The apical cardiac impulse, oops, um, sorry, it appears on screen. Sorry, please, my network is not reaching. Let me do. No problem. Chivuka, I hope your network is not. Okay. All right. The apical cardiac impulse is laterally displaced towards the anterior axillary line. And on auscultation, there is normal S1, paradoxically split S2, an apical S3 gallop, and grade 3 over 6 hollow systolic momo at the apex that radiates to the axilla. There is no peripheral edema. His ECG is shown in figure 3.19. So the question they're asking is which of the following is the most appropriate approach to device therapy in this patient? Can you scroll to the ECG? Let's take a look at 3.19. All right, so this is the patient's ECG. Um, let's pay attention to the QRS, because that is one most important uh, uh, <clears throat> determinant of uh, whether or not he's going to need uh, a CRT or, or not. So if you look at the ECG here, we're going to see that, particularly if you look at uh, B1 and B6, you can see that it's looking more like uh, man has a left bundle branch block pattern and uh, while QRS uh, complex. Let's go back to the question. Okay, so uh, which of the following is the most appropriate approach to device therapy in this patient? A, they said no device implantation is indicated. B, implantation of cardiovascular defibrillator is warranted. C, implantation of combined cardiac resynchronization defibrillator system is appropriate. Uh, can you scroll down to the last option? Okay. 
Um, D says refer the patient for echocardiography to assess the synchrony and if present implant a cardiac resynchronization defibrillator. And lastly, implantation of cardiac desynchronization pacemaker without defibrillation capability is appropriate. So if we look at uh, the medication this patient is having, we can agree that he is on the optimal goal-directed medical therapy. And yet he is having what seems to look like uh, advanced heart failure with the pattern of ECG that we've seen, this patient will definitely going to benefit among all these options based on the guidelines he is definitely going to benefit from, from uh, dual chamber cardiac resynchronization therapy. So the most appropriate answer to the question is Hello, can you use, uh, just scroll up, please? Back to it. Okay. So the A option is definitely false, that no device implantation is indicated. An implantation of a cardiovascular defibrillator uh, is warranted. And C says implantation of a combined cardiac resynchronization defibrillator system is appropriate. The most appropriate uh, answer to this question is C. Do you have any questions, any contributions, any comments? All right, can we move on? Okay, question 392. This is an electrophysiologic tracing that is shown in figure 3.20, which was obtained from a 29 year old man with palpitations, current syncope, and a structurally normal heart. He said, which of the following is the most appropriate uh, therapy? Um, let's take a look at the figure 3.20. Should I scroll to the image? Yeah, let's go to the image. Let's take a look at it first. Image 3.20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the network I've scrolled. I don't know. It's refusing to show. Okay. Let's just give it a little time. I don't know where it's from my end. Though. I'm no more seeing the project, the projected text. Yeah, the screen, the screen sharing is gone. I think the network having some challenges. I was trying to give us some little time to see if it's come back on. All right, sir. Let's 
ازاي نجيب ايه كان اوكي اول ثانك يو فيري ماتش از اوبن رونين اول سو ذس از انادر electrophysiology intracardiac ECG tracing I, I believe we've seen quite a number of this kind of ECG so it is not something uh, that is quite strange to uh, also because of that I'm sick of time I'm not there for to look on this one if you look at these tracings very carefully We'll look at let's see the normal surface ECGs it shows lead one, two, three, and B1. We look at it, you we'll see like particularly in B1 and also in the two. Oops, on again. Hello. Hello, Doctor Sawa. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I don't know. Um, I don't know that is the network. It all went quiet. Oh, okay. The screen sharing uh went off. So I'm actually quiet. I'm waiting for because I'm trying to describe the electrophysiology tracing. But if you guys want me to continue without the image while we are waiting for her to bring it up again. I can continue. Okay, please let's wait for the image, sir. I'm so sorry, my network suddenly became very unstable. I'm connecting on both my phone and my laptop, so I'm sharing with the laptop and it's it keeps going off. Let me just log out and log in again. We understand, so sorry. Hello, Dr. Fayad. Oh, she said she's going to log off and log back on again. Yes. Okay. It's coming up. Okay. Thank you very much. So, if we look at uh, the surface ECG in lead one, we'll see that there seems to be a very short period in time with the presence of the delta wave. Uh, this signifies that the likely possibility of uh, a deeply field of this syndrome that we're looking at here in, in this patient. So going down to the intracardiac uh, ECG tracing, the high right atrial uh, that the HRA now electrodes, we can see the, the high. Uh, there's actually uh, atrial activity, yes, that confirms it. Then the 
his bundle electrophysiology gives us the AV interval and also the HV interval. The right ventricular lead is the last lead down there. Now, what most one most important thing we have to pay attention to is the AH interval, which is about 90 milliseconds. If you recall earlier on when we were talking about normal AH interval, you can absolutely see here that there is really, really a decrease in as a shortening of this uh, AH and HV interval. This is 90 meters per second to 45 meters per second. So this confirms the presence of a short PR interval and the presence of delta wave confirms uh, the, like, the possibility of a wolf Parkinson white syndrome that we're actually seeing here. So this is just a summary of what this uh, uh, tracing is. So can we go back to the options and see what is there? Right answer for us here. Okay. So uh you said which of the following is the most appropriate terror? Okay. A Atenol long, B, verapamil, C, pacemaker implantation, D, radiofrequency catheter application, and E, defibrillator implantation. Now, uh, atenol long and uh, verapamil are actually not. Uh, uh, they, they, these are uh, nodal blocking agents. They are actually contraindicated in the presence of the BWD syndrome because they are going to block the AV channel. And if the AV channel is blocked, what it means is that conduction across the accessory pathway is going to be augmented and thereby uh, worsening the aberrant conduction that is causing the problem at the initial uh, in the heart. Pacemaker implantation is actually because we are not having a problem of uh, pacing here. So this is actually not going to be the correct answer. The most appropriate uh, thing to do in patients with the BPW syndrome is actually radiofrequency catheter ablation. Uh, uh, the temporary basis maybe before that time we might consider defibrillator, but it is not the most appropriate to do in, in this patient. Based on the recommended guidelines, this patient, the most appropriate thing to put the patient is uh, the frequency catheter ablation, where the uh, aberrant pathway is isolated and uh, ablated, and that is going to give a long-term curative therapy for this patient. Any questions? Comments, contributions. Okay. So, in the absence of any, can we proceed to the next one? All right, question 393 says, which of the following statements about the antiarrhythmic drug Dofetilide is not correct. A. It has significant renal excretion. B. It prolongs QT interval in a dose uh, dependent fashion. We're looking at answer that is not correct. A significant renal excretion of uh, dofetilide is actually true. Dofetilide is actually a class 3. Uh, anti arrhythmic drug, and uh, the main effect of uh, the drug is actually exhibited by uh, blocking of the uh, rectifier potassium current, and uh, it's said to have much more significant impact on the right atrium. It is renally excreted predominantly. And C says it is unsafe in patients with prior myocardial infarction. Now we are looking for the 
answer that it's uh, not correct. So C seems to be uh, the, our answer right now here because it's actually not uh, on safe in patients who have primary cardiac infarction. D, patient must be admitted to hospital for drug initiation. That is not, that is uh, true. You don't give the drug just like that orally and allow patients to go home. Then it should not be used in patients taking verapamil. This is uh, also true. So the one that is not correct here is that it is on saving patients with prior myocardial infarction. Any question, contributions, comments? All right, now we move on yeah. to the next one. Yes, let's fire on first. No okay, now, now we move on to the next one. It's already some few minutes after 11, and I can sense uh, quite a number of us are very tired, including myself. I am struggling to keep awake. All right, 3946, a 26-year-old construction worker comes to the emergency department on the morning of January 2nd. And yeah, yeah. he states that for the past few months, he has had occasional episodes of palpitations, almost always on Mondays. His vital signs include heart rate of 140 beats per minute, respiration of 16 breaths per minute, and blood pressure of 160.95. His physical examination is unremarkable. While being observed in the hospital, he spontaneously reverts to normal sinus reading. The most likely precipitating cause is A, caffeine. B, cocaine, C, alcohol, D, hypertension, and E, mitral valve uh, prolapse. Uh, let's pay attention to this. History is a young man, and uh, it seems to have a kind of pattern. He came actually on January 2nd, had a lot of uh, holidays for the new year, so most likely he must have taken some lots of alcoholic things. So if you recall the holiday heart syndrome. This is likely what this patient is having. So the most likely precipitating cause for this patient is uh, alcohol, which is C. So the answer of 394 is uh, C. Caffeine and cocaine don't commonly cause uh, AF. Uh, likewise, uh, hypertension and mitral but yes, it can cause some form of chest pain and arrhythmias, but typically alcohol is the most likely agent among these listed to be responsible for this patient's AF, particularly with the periodicity and the timing of this AF that we are doing this, that was being described in this question. So the answer is alcohol, three, nine, four, new addition, questions, contributions. Okay. Let's proceed, 395. So for 395 to 398, it said for each of the following descriptions, match the appropriate disorder. A is Javelange Nelson syndrome, B, Romano Ward syndrome, C is right ventricular alpha tract tachycardia, D, Brugada. So we're supposed to match this ABCD options with uh, the descriptions made in 395 to 398. So let's take a look at uh, 395. 395 says autosomal recessive disorder associated with sensory neural deafness. So uh, among uh, Jebel Lange and Nelson syndrome with Romano Ward syndrome, these are the two uh, similar uh, uh, syndrome that have a uh, kind of similar presentation, but with some differences in their presentation. Now, one of the most important thing here is one is autosomal recessive, while the other one is autosomal dominant. And if I recall, there's a, someone who uh, he commonly used to say among these two, the best and easiest way he usually remembers uh, the difference here is using the sensory neural deafness, using Roman Ward syndrome. 
in his word, he said, Romano word has the one that has word inside, they used to hear word. So they don't have any sensory neural deafness. So the other one now is the other one. That means Jebel Lange and Nielsen syndrome would be the ones that would have uh, sensory neural deafness. So autosomal recessive disorder associated with sensory neural deafness is Jebel Lange Nielsen syndrome. So the answer to 395 is A. Then ECG shows right bundle branch 396, right bundle branch block morphology with ST segment elevation in the anterior precordial leads. This sounds much more like uh, our Brugada because there's a right bundle branch morphology and ST segment elevation in the anterior precordial leads. Commonly, typically, it's been described as curved segment, ST segment elevation. So our screen is gone again. I think the network is clear. I mean, network has started. Mm -hmm. But he's tired, including the network. Thank you. Sorry for the trouble. So, 396D, Brugada. 397, autosomal dominant, long QT syndrome, normal hearing. Like I said earlier, B. It's Romano Ward syndrome. They have normal hearing. And lastly, left bundle branch block with an inferior active described right ventricular outflow tract uh, tachycardia. Any questions, comments, uh, contributions? All right, moving on. So let's go to three. Question three, nine, nine, and four hundred. It says match the following antiarrhythmic drugs actions with the appropriate von Williams drug classification. School back up a bit. Yeah. Okay. A. It says predominantly block potassium channel and prolonged repolarization. B. Predominantly block beta adrenergic receptors. C. Predominantly block calcium channels. That's the uh, late. Uh, calcium channels. D, reduce the rate of rise of action potential of stroke as the VMAX and prolong action potential duration. E, block sodium channel to shorten the action potential duration and do not reduce the VMAX. So, uh, 399 is class 1A drugs, 400 is class uh, 2 drugs. So, I think maybe probably since they are all together, probably we should just take all of them to four zero two one and this class three four one is class three drugs where class four uh drugs is four oh two now and just a quick refresher about the von Williams classification of uh antiarrhythmic drugs the class one uh sodium channel blockers and they are divided into one a one b and 1C, while the class two drugs are beta blockers, uh, class three are potassium channel blockers, and uh, class four are calcium channel blockers. Now the 1A calcium channel blockers, they actually have uh, the, the block sodium channels, and they are, <clears throat> like I said, they are divided into three subgroups. The one a example of, of those is cunidine, disopyramide, and cocainamide. Uh, commonly, what they actually do is that they reduce uh, 
the rate of rise of action potential and we also prolong uh, repolarization. While class B drugs like uh, that is what where we have examples of drug like lidocaine, phenytoin, and mexilatin. They reduce uh, B max, and uh, they also minimally have effect on action potential. In fact, some will tell you that they don't even have any effect on action potential. Whether prolonging it, they're actually neutral as far as action potential is concerned. While class 1C drugs such as uh, flaconide and propafenone, they reduce, uh, re they shorten repolarization and uh, they prolong refractory uh, period. Now, class 3 drugs are the beta blockers. Uh, example is uh, timolol, propranolol, and metoprolol. And uh, class three drugs, uh, example where we have amiodarone, dronadarone, ibutilite, and profetilite. This block the potassium channels and prolong uh, repolarization. And uh, class four drugs are the slow calcium channel blockers such as verapamil and deltiazem. So in that order, looking at this, we now see that uh, class one. 399 class 1A drugs, the best that describe them, like we said, is that they reduce the rate of rise is option D. They reduce the rate of rise of the action potential of stroke and prolong action potential. While class 2 drugs, uh, the best option among that describes them here because they are the beta blockers, so they predominantly block beta adrenergic receptors. So class 400, Option 400, number 400, the option is B, while uh, 401, uh, class 3 drugs, they predominantly block potassium channel and they prolong repolarization. So the best one that describes 401 is A. Then lastly, 402, the class uh, 4 drugs, these are they predominantly block the slow calcium channel. So 402 is C. That concludes the segment of this question. Sorry, I have to take it to 402 just to because they are all lumped up together. Any comments, contributions, or questions? Hello. Can you yes? Can you go through the class one A, one B, one C again? Okay. Now, class one drugs, all of them they are sodium channel blockers. They are subdivided into three: one A, one B, and one C. Examples of one A is the quinidine disopyramide and procainamide. Their effects, what they do, general all block sodium potassium channels, but they have varying ways in doing that and it reflects in the Vmax and also the duration of action potential and repolarization. So in class one, they actually reduce action potential of stroke. That means they are reducing Vmax and prolongation of action potentials. So 1A, prolong action potential, reduce Vmax. It, in, it also increases repolarization time. 1B, an example is Lidocaine, mexilatin, phenytoin. They also reduce Vmax, but to a very minimal extent. And they can also shorten action potential. They don't have effect on repolarization. 
Class 1C drugs, an example of them is flecainide, propafenone. They reduce Vmax. Also, they slow conduction. And they also prolong action potential and increases uh, repolarization time. I don't know if that is clear or not. Hello, Chief. Please, can you send this to the group? Thank. Can you please send it to the group? Sorry. Like what, what you, you just said. Can you please just send it to the group? Okay, no problem. <laughs> Thanks. God bless. Okay. Any more questions? Hello? Is it possible we can finish 402? 402? Yeah, I just did till 402. Good, good. So probably the next we're going to start, the next person that will continue will start from 403. But I guess... Uh, this might not be an appropriate time to continue considering the fact that the majority of people are sounding for Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Sawa. Um, we may have to close here, except we Others feel otherwise about that. Yeah, no, okay. Um, in the in view of things now, we just realized that we are still um, lagging behind quite markedly. Let us recall that Sunday this week. Please, could we stop the recording so that we make all these announcements? Hello? John? Now, Sunday this week, we'll be having a, we'll make effort to see if we can have access to the Recall questions. So we may start it Sunday this week. Um, all odds being equal. Let us equally recall that we will equally have a discussion on Saturday this week as we had earlier thought of because we are really behind schedule now. We just say we should just put up a reminder like that. We may just, uh, and with that, uh, other subsequent announcements will be on the blog. Between now and the uh, and between, between now and within the weekend, we'll be on the blog. We'll just say we should highlight this one so that we'll not forget. That we will we'll have discussion tomorrow, and that on Sundays we may start um, re answering recall if we could have access to them for them. Thank you very much, Chief Kweki. Uh, sorry, Chief. Uh our discussion, okay, is in the morning, right? Sorry, what time is the discussion for tomorrow? It's usually in the evening, the same evening. It can't be in okay, the morning no. because general medicine usually stay in the morning. Tomorrow okay, okay this sorry, what are we doing tomorrow? Is, is it um, brown world we are doing tomorrow? We are still hanging on brown world, yes, yes, yes. But in the night, we may likely, um, on Sunday, we may likely answer answer um recall recall if we have access to it but if we don't we may continue with our brown wall most likely we'll start a recall sometime from next week okay then okay lastly chief um you know we're supposed to have a lecture with prof for tomorrow we're saying something about 4 4 30. So okay I yeah. I we've, we've not been able to confirm with prof but you know that our chief them quickly and and others could give us lecture either tomorrow or next. I'm trying to see if I reconnect Chief Quickie now. I reconnect with Chief Quickie now. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
when are we problems? Hello. 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 Yes, Chief, we can hear you, sir. Okay, so uh, like we're done for the day, right? Yes, sir. We're just wondering whether you will be able to give us a lecture tomorrow or next. On Sunday by six o'clock, effective endocarditis. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, I'll uh, announce it on the group. I'm trying to right. on Sunday by six o'clock. Okay, six PM, right? Sunday. Yeah, for one hour. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Infective endocarditis. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I, I've been trying to reach Prof. I don't know if you will help me reach him now. Mm, we'll we'll connect. connect. We'll connect. He will be around for this discussion. Too. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Thank you. Maybe tomorrow we'll take up more discussions from there. By that Sunday, we'll take up more um communications from there. Mm. Yes, sir. Okay, myself and Okot, we are working on a list of all the fellows that will do the presentation. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Really appreciate, sir. Yeah, yeah, well, thank God. All right. You can give us closer remarks, sir. That's it's everything uh, that I've always said. Uh, it's a good job. Let's keep on the spirit. The thing about the exam is that as I've always said, you have to build your stuff to that level. So it's a continuous discussion. The only time that you rest is after the exam. So let's continue this spirit. We've almost hit 100, right? Yes, 402 today. 402, exactly. So that's a good number. I can see that we're already in cardiac units. So... So that's a good one. So let's keep up the spirit. In the past, people that have been part of this group have had fantastic past. So that you are here, it's a sign that you pass. Just be committed. Okay, thank you so much. I would, so I, we've contributed, I know that we've uh, made